Hello everyone, thank you for coming this evening. I appreciate taking time out of your busy week to uh, come to this teaching, which inshallah will be some, we'll have some really good questions for Brother Mufti Sultan, uh, good dialogue, and inshallah towards the end we'll have a QA. Um, I'm going to start with a, just a simple da'a, a simple but very meaningful da'a. Bismillah. O oh Allah, show me the truth as truth and guide me to follow it. Show me the falsehood as falsehood and guide me to avoid it. This time means a lot, especially today, with the things that we're dealing with, the propaganda, the quote-unquote Hasbara, and things of that nature. Um, inshallah, tonight's event will open up many eyes and many hearts to the plight of the Ummah. That is the main reason why I'm here. As a Palestinian, I don't view any Muslim issue as, as you know, I don't view the Palestinian issue as a Palestinian issue. I don't view a, a, an issue in Pakistan with our Muslim brothers and sisters, or in Yemen, or in Afghanistan, or in Syria, or in Libya, or wherever it may be. Injustice for any human being, and especially our brothers and sisters in Islam, um, needs to be the, at, at, at the root of all of our hearts. So that is the reason why I'm here tonight. Um, and inshallah, we're going to have good dialogue and good questions set up for our brother here. I do just want to make a statement. I want to thank al Awada for helping uh, sponsor this event and <clears throat> getting it together. And I just want to tell you guys a little bit about Al-Awada. I'm not a part of al Awada, but I do help any coalition that fights against injustice anywhere. Um, al is, uh is an organization uh, that fights for Palestinians' uh, right to return. It is a broad-based, nonpartisan, democratic, and charitable organization of grassroots activists. A lot of the activities that you're seeing right now in the community, a lot of the activities that you're seeing in South Florida, um, they are behind that, or they are one of the organizations behind that. Uh, and they work with various organizations that fight for freedom. Uh, they approach the fight for liberalization from a secular perspective and host educational seminars. That's our co-host. <laughs> Last weekend, we partnered with the Haitian community to understand the intersections of the two struggles and how they are intertwined. Or, so, I don't want to rant, rant on for too long. Um, as a Palestinian, you're born trying to figure out geopolitics and the way the world works. You're born into that. It's not a by <coughs> choice. You have to figure out the way the world works, right? Um, so what I've done in recent years is I've strictly focused on geopolitics and domestic and foreign policies that are going on here in the cities and across the world. Little did I know that anywhere you see wars, whether it's in Haiti, whether it's in Venezuela, whether it's Cuba, whether it's, you know, any country in the world where there's chaos, and you watch it on the news and you're just like, oh, these are just crazy people killing one another, right? Or, you know, black and brown people can't get their stuff together. Or Muslims, they're backwards people. They don't understand how to live. After meeting people from different communities, we all have the same issue. Islamically, it's a little bit different because we have our internal issues that we have to deal with. But it's imperialism. It's neo-colonialism, right? But as Muslim, we can't sit there and just point the finger and try to figure out how to beat colonialism and imperialism with just a secular way or a secular perspective approach. I'm a true believer and I believe that it starts with an us individual. And that's why it is going to be my goal, inshallah, to try to bridge the gap 
between all Muslims around the world. I was just in Palestine this past summer. And I went there the last three years, and I've lived there two years myself. I'm driving around through our villages, and I'm asking myself, how is it that we're like 1.6, 1.7 billion people? And we're in a measure that I swear. But how is it that we are getting our behinds kicked at every level? How is it? If it's not, you know, if it's not Libya and Sudan now, if it's not Sudan and Yemen, if it's not, if you have the Arabs in, 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 the, in, the, in the Gulf countries that are essentially sellouts or too afraid to speak up. How is it? And I'm over here in Palestine and I'm looking at these Palestinians and they've been existing and resisting for 75 years against a world power. Israel is not some little state in the Middle East. It is a world power. But how is it, mashallah, and I'm proud to say that, you know, we're all one home, but how is it that these people here are able to live in this type of situation for 75 years and still act as if not? I swear to God, I saw this when I was driving one day. We're driving through the settlement, and there's machine guns pointed at us. And there's a wedding with like a caravan of cars, and the kid is outside of the sunroof dancing, and there's a machine gun pointed at him. That kills Zionists. That kills imperialists. What they want to do is they want to break your will. They want you to fear your deed. They want you to fear your culture. They want you to fear being brown, they want you to fear being whatever you are, because they want to instill that in you so that you're afraid to speak up, so that you're afraid to come together as a Roma, you know, and I say this with no disregard to anybody, we have a lot of tribalism, which it's okay sometimes, right, and we're going to speak about that tonight, um, but we're afraid to speak up for causes that don't, what we don't think affect us. I'm going to tell you right now, Everything that is happening in Palestine is, is going to affect you and your children for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What they're doing right now in this country is they're dismantling the family fabric. The only resistance this country has is Islamic traditional beliefs. Period. I heard Christians say it myself. Islam is the only religion who fights back against what's going on in our country today. Everything is connected. Imperialism, colonialism, Western liberalism, it is all connected. And that is why my first goal, inshallah, is to help bridge and bring the communities together, wherever they're at, whatever part of the world they're from, not so that they can fight for Palestine, but that they're knowledgeable about when they're sitting at a dinner table or having a party about what's going on with their domestic policy, their foreign policy, and how to combat it by having you stand at the core of who you are and educate yourself, educate the future generations so that they don't make the same mistakes that our parents made unintentionally when they only came here to make money and buy a home and live lives and live peacefully and they thought that they couldn't speak up because they're just immigrants we can't do that anymore. And the only way to fight that is with the knowledge that, inshallah, we're going to present tonight, along with, inshallah, searching and seeking your own knowledge so that you're preparing your children. Your children need more than anything else in the world. Your household does. So please, thank you. I kind of let it out for a little while, but um, I'm going to move forward with the program. And I'll give Mr. Mufti Sultan the mic once I ask him the first question. I'm pretty sure you guys have been watching a lot of Pierce Morgan. Um, so the first question is, do you condemn the horrific effects, attacks that happened on October 7th by the terrorist group Hamas? الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. عليكم السلام. Somebody get this man a job for like Fox or CNN or something, bro. What's that? Somebody get you a job for like CNN or Fox or something, bro. What is this question? This question. Do you condemn Hamas? I mean, look. In order to condemn, we have to. This is an Islamic program. The whole program is centered around how we can make Islam the core of it. So Islamically, condemnation. The concept of condemnation alone, how do we view it as a whole? Before a Muslim can answer a question like that, it's important for a Muslim to know how we in our deen even view the art of condemnation. The art of condemnation is that you, firstly, the first principle is you don't condemn the sinner, you condemn the sin. We say that, but then when the sin becomes a little bit distasteful, then we're like, okay, but for this sin, we're going to need to condemn the entire sinner. You get what I'm saying? But the principle, Islam is a very principled religion, which is why the Prophet ﷺ, if you study the seerah, if you study the politics of what went on, you'd see it was very unconventional to what anybody else, any other world leader would have done. You know what I'm saying? The mercy that he showed at the places that he showed it, and the punishment that he showed at the places that he showed it, his words of mercy, his words of praise, his words of condemnation, his words for prayer for a people, his words of prayer against a people, all of these guidelines that the Prophet ﷺ showed us through his actions were very calculated so that we can follow those exact same footsteps when we become his followers. So for us Muslims, the condemnation, you condemn something, not what, but who, the, who did that something, okay? First, secondly, the second principle is now if a person is to be condemned so that they can now be punished for what they're condemned for, that that condemnation has to be proven thoroughly. The condemnation has to be proven thoroughly. And do we, I mean in general, like if, if one of these new channels, I'm not going to mention their name, if one of these channels just gives you some news, right? And it's like some brand new information that you kind of never knew before. Especially like now, like are you are you really trusting in general? No. Prior to October, whatever, in general people were skeptical against the media anyways. So now when someone tells you something automatically confirming that it indeed happened as the way they did it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us the principle from the Quran. If a person who is known for openly for committing sins, has the media not lied ever in its history? I'm just asking you a question. Has the media never ever lied? In? So now, if you answer the question in the affirmative, then this Quran verse applies that if a person who has openly sinned, and the sin of lying is especially the sin that's being calculated here, if a person has openly sinned, come to you with a news, Investigate. Do your research. Don't confirm it. So now, if a person were to just start off, like, do you condemn this organization? I'm not even going to say names here. I'm just talking about principles. Now, we take these principles and we apply them in our activism, okay? So now, you talk about what this organization. I don't know who is this organization. I don't know these people. Do I know anybody from amongst them? A lot of us might know but the whole ins and outs and the principles and the details, and we don't know them. We don't know who they are. So for most of us, right? We don't know who they are. So again, if you don't know someone, you don't condemn something unless you see proof of it. So now if you see proof of it, that whoever it is they're asking you to condemn has actually done something abhorrent, not according to the standards of proof provided by the media, but the standards of proof according to our Allah Azawajal. Now, if someone shows you that proof that they did that, then in that case, we proceed by saying we condemn all killings of innocent life. And if somebody has indeed violated the terms of my Rasulullah in engaging in warfare, then I condemn this person and this person should not retain possession. This person is definitely a tyrant because you know, Rasulullah's principles of war are the only ones that I deem that are fair. Now, if somebody violates this, they are now a tyrant to me, regardless of who they are. You know what I'm saying? Did we not have Muslim tyrants in the past? You get what I'm saying? We did have people who claimed this son, I tried to be useful. Tyrant, tyrant, this man worked so hard. So again, what do we do? We go and take it back to a logical, principle-based discussion. 
You don't answer with your emotions. You don't answer with passion. You don't answer, you can answer with passion. But the passion that galvanates a person to go off course and then lead a person to now believe that this person doesn't even want to engage properly with me in a conversation, you've already had a loss. You need to get a person who's asking you this question. Chances are they're not thinking clearly themselves, which is why they're like a parrot repeating this question to you. You get what I'm saying? Like a parrot. They're taught to ask this. That's why. So now you need to go into their brain and see that there's a lot of blockades here. That's why they're seeing the world as do you condemn this. Now, my goal in life is not to, to, to uh, convert anybody to any kind of ideology, but my goal is to state the truth in the most elegant and the most prophetic and in the most professional and in the most truthful way possible, even if it's assertive and passionate. Now, if you remember these principles, inshallah, you won't go wrong with answering that question. And if a person who's asking you this question was indeed, you know, uh, affected with some evil disease of, of, of bias in their heart, Allah says, <laughs> When engaging in verbal combat, <laughs> defend, no problem. Defend against what is, the, uh, what is falsehood or what is truth. But defend in a beautiful way. Why? It's very likely that a person who five seconds ago was your enemy could now become your best friend. And that's why, again, some of us have heard me say this story before, and uh, I, I want to repeat this just so it can kind of serve as an example. I want to show you a live example of an interaction I've had with someone who was kind of like this. A replay of what I felt was a very poetic incident or a quranic episode in today's time. This guy comes to me, uh, it's, it's at a gym, it's, it's like a boxing gym, he's my classmate, old man, and he he comes to me and he sees me wearing something, you know, Muslim one day, and he's like, that stuff that you're wearing, why? What is that? Obviously, it's not Muslim. Okay. And then, oh, it's not Muslim, so that means you, you like uh, those, those Palestine people? Yeah, I love them. I love people. They're my family. You like bad people, man. And then he barely could speak English, but he just kept going on this right old man. Right now, I was very upset. In that moment, I wanted to lash out and I wanted to say, so you who support baby killing, you do this, you do that. And my, my nafs is telling me that say this to this man. The quick little pause that I had was a simple question I asked myself in that moment. Oh, Sultan, what would your messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam do you claim to be a follower of do in this moment? Would he lash out on this man because he was mad at him? Or would he do what he did to the man who came and desecrated the house of Allah and urinated in the corner of the masjid and say, Brother, you know, this house has been made for worship. We do those things outside. That's what my Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does. And what did he say also? He explicitly said a hadith. Anzilunas, a beautiful hadith. Remember this and make this your motto. Anzilunas, manazilahum. Treat people's levels according to what they are. If a person's level of understanding is at a certain place, meet them at that place and try to explain to them from there. Don't start from where you know. If you start from where you know, you've already lost them because they don't. Know, they're not at your level. You need to come down. You need to land your plane into their level of ignorance and then take them up with you. So what I did was, I was like, I called myself a little bit huffed and puffed or whatever. Allah, Rabbi Shahim Sulli, wa yisili abdi, wa hadu ra'udatan min lisan yizlahu lawi. Dua of our Prophet Musa, when Allah told him to go talk to the Fir'aun, to go release and free Bani Yisra'i. When he did that, that was his hashtag, free Bani Yisra'i. Before he went to go talk to the Fir'aun, the dua he made, oh Allah, Rabbi Shahim Sulli, stand for me, my chest, make my chest open. I feel constricted. This conversation that you're asking me to get into is going to make me feel very suffocated. Oh, Allah, open it up for me, somebody. And even if it's my heart is open, it's going to be difficult. Ease for me my task. I'm still my, I'm still going to stumble. I'm still going to stutter. Oh, love, I'm scared. Untie all these knots. So they can clearly understand and comprehend what I say. Make me a, a help, give me a help, give me, I, I, want, I want support, I don't want to do this alone. Let that helper be my brother. 
وشتم به أزري strengthen my resolve وأشتكه في أمي make him an actual partner make him a prophet with me كي يسبحها كثيرا he doesn't say so that we can go and win against the Fir'aun that's the principle I want to establish he doesn't say so we can go and win against the Fir'aun he says كي يسبحها كثيرا the purpose of it is oh Allah we can praise you Allah وَنَذْكُرَكَ كَثِيرًا O Allah, so we can remember you, Allah. إِنَّكَ كُنْتَ بِنَا بَصِيرًا O Allah, we're just scattered humans on this earth. You're the one who's watching over us. We think we're all mighty with these efforts and this and that. Ya Allah, I'm nothing. You're the one who's watching. How I need all this help, Ya So when you have this dua, naturally what it does to you, it, it, it instills within you a confidence to have the might of the Prophet Musa but also the humility of Rasulullah and these two qualities paired will inspire your tongue to naturally say those things which are true. You don't have to now memorize words. You don't have to now remember all these facts. Some people, it doesn't work with facts, like I'm about to tell you it didn't work. What, it didn't work with his old man. What did it work, what did it work with him? What is subhanAllah, I asked him a simple question. But do you see, do you see sandwich? Yeah, Spanish originates, you know, so we're talking about Spain, right? So, Spain comes to my mind. I'm going to give you an example. If I went to Spain and I took somebody's apartment, I went in Barcelona, Madrid, somewhere, and I sold them, stole their apartment, or I went up to them, knocked, I asked them a question. I was like, if I came to your apartment, you live there, and I knocked on your door, and you've been living there, your grandparents have been living there, it's your land. And I knock on the door at 3 a.m. You open the door and you ask me, like, what are you doing here? And I tell you, my ancestors used to live here in Spain. All these houses that you see, Allah and everything, is still engraved there. We still actually have proof that we used to live here. Okay? It's not just hearsay. It's not just like, oh, 2,000 years ago. No, no, no. This is now. We actually lived here. We ruled here. And we ruled here studying the history with justice. I think I have a bigger right to belong in your apartment than you do. What would you say to me? He told me, Papi. So I said, Papi, what would you say to me? What are we doing? He said, I, if I'm being very nice to you, I'm going to slam the door in your face. I said, okay. I said, let me up it a notch. I said, I said, I say to you, now if you don't leave by tomorrow, I'm actually going to go with the police and I'm going to make you leave. Then what are we doing? He said, Papi, it's war. And I said, that's what's happening, Papi. He's like, Viva Palestine. <laughs> and he started getting the whole chip to chip. Viva Palestine. In my head, this guy was just like that. Was, yeah, exactly. So that's why I just, you, the principle I want to establish is never sway from your Islamic principle, even if you see other people who are supporting our cause doing it. Doing it. We don't learn from them, we learn from our teacher. And I end up with this before I hand you to you for the next question. This was in Aqsa. I saw it in, in August. In Masjid al Aqsa. It says very beautifully, boldly, لَن تَرْكَعَ أُمَّةٌ قَائِدُهَا Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم A nation will not kneel whose leader is Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم If our leaders become these random people, we learn how to protest and active, that activism works stuff. Nah, it's, again, we kneeling. We kneeling to their ways of doing things. You get what I'm saying? Rasulullah صلى did not do that. He was very unconventional and his Blueprint always has to be our blueprint. That's the only way we're going to get our Isa back. I mean, shukran shir. Do I have to even put this on my head? No, yeah. I do. No. Or you can, uh, you could speak into it. Yeah, but you got to put this side right there. Oh. Okay, so in regards to what Mufti was just speaking about, um, I had to do some research myself regarding, you know, because Western liberalism, secularism, you know, this is like a 100, 150 year old ideology, guys. And we see where it's heading. So I said, you know what? I was actually at a teaching uh, in Little Haiti this past Sunday. And I started speaking to people that are not even Muslim. But I approached them from an Islamic perspective, just with a little bit of knowledge that I gained. How many people in here know the rules to engagement or the law for war in Islam? How many people know that? Like, could you just raise your hand if you know it? One, two, three, uh, four, five, six. 
So six people know the rules to engagement is spent. Now, I'm sure you guys have all heard on CNN and all these other channels. Oh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Oh, the United Nations resolutions. This and that and blah, 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 blah. I've been listening to the United Nations resolutions since the day I was born. The ICC has never, ever, ever taken anyone to court that has power. Let's just keep it at that, okay? So, I said, okay, these people act as if they have the answers to everything, yet they're not following what they're teaching in Western liberal America and Europe. So let me go back to this backwards religion, and I say that sarcastically, Islam. This backwards religion that's about 1,400 years old, right? How did this religion thrive in areas where there were Christians and Jews living? And how did they give them their rights? How did they win battles and wars? What were the rules of engagement? So this brother said that you know the rules of engagement, right? Do you mind if I give you the mic? I, I'm trying, I'm doing No? Okay. I know maybe like one or two. Okay, so what can you just give me one or two? Um, prisoners of war must be treated with like respect. Um, you're not allowed to like burn any props or uh, I, I think it's just uh, some people are along like that. So those are two things that 1,400 years ago were not okay, right? 1,400 years ago, these things were not okay. It's 2023 in the most progressive quote-unquote nation in the world. And I wonder if they're burning crops or bombing homes or killing innocents. So, uh, Mufti, I'm going to hand it over to you if you could just go through each rule of war quickly for them. And just, so that way you guys can go back and now you have this weapon, not the International Criminal Court, not the United Nations and their resolutions, not secular ways to view things for injustice and justice. Now you have this actual weapon that it is at our core, it's that. So this way we can stop lying to ourselves, okay? So Mufti, if you can, could you just kind of point out what they are and, and then we'll go to the next question. So the Prophet said, Allah, my name is Sam says, you don't kill innocents, you don't kill women, children, you don't kill non combatants, you don't kill people who can't defend themselves, you can't, you don't, uh, so that extends to like every person who can't defend themselves, whether it's like special needs, whether it's, you know, any person who can't fight for themselves. Basically, somebody who's not out there trying to kill you, you don't kill them. Right? Simple rule. All these things, all these categories of people are not meant to be like isolated to these categories. The Prophet is enlisting a couple of people that may be innocent in warfare. But now, amongst those combatants, that's why, again, when you state a principle, you have to state it third. That's the principle. Now, these categories of people, if they do, for example, now if there is indeed an older person trying to, to, to claim your life in war, and an incident is reported about a Sahabi of the Prophet of taking that person out, then in that case, it's not a violation of that rule. You get what I'm saying? So that's what, again, not Muslim, they try to point out inconsistencies from our head history to what was actually, you know, stated by him. And they say, well, see, he said this, but they didn't actually do this. What we need to understand is understanding these things properly. It's a principled statement that someone who's not, not out there to fight you, you don't fight them. And how do we see its implementation? We use an example of somebody, this is an authentic incident because it's the closest person to the Prophet, one of the closest people to the Prophet who is recording this. Now there is a Sahabi, a companion of the Prophet by the name of Usama bin Zayn. Has anyone ever heard of him before? Usama bin Zayn. Who is Zayn, his father? His, his father is Zayn bin Hadatha. Zayn bin Hadatha, who is he? He is the adopted son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So very close to him that even when his father, who lost him in, in, in childhood, and who would like scoured the earth looking for his beloved child, when he finally found him, and he found him with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they were both like exchanging hugs and, and sad and crying on each other's shoulders, Zayd and Haritha. And when that conversation was over, he says, Zayd, let's go home. He says, no, this is my home. Muhammad, I love you, Father, and I, I missed you a lot, just like, but I'm not leaving you. Right? So that's how much the Prophet's son loves Zayd. Now, Zayd's son, they say there is there's nothing more beloved than a child, than, more than a child, than a child's child. Like, I'm Muhammad, I would say, the soul of my soul. You get what I'm saying? Well, your child's child. 
So now this is Usama. I'm giving you a context of who this person is. Usama bin Zayn bin Halida. This is this person. They nicknamed him for Rasulullah. The person who was Rasulullah's mahdoob, his beloved. Anybody who wanted anything out of Rasulullah, any kind of images, they would go to him directly. But if it was something really, really bad they did and you wanted to see, they would just pull out of Usama. Because you know what I'm saying? It's all about the system. Usama is in war. Usama's a warrior. You know what I'm saying? Usama is like young, he's hot blooded. You know what I'm saying? One of the last things the Prophet did before he passed away was his say, You better dispatch this army and his head got out of Usama. When the Prophet actually passed away, again, the Sahaba, look how principled they were. Omar Abu Bakr and the elderly Sahaba, they engaged in the discussion. They're like, Usama, uh, oh, Abu Bakr, he's not fighting for the person that's sorry. He's not actually of age, he's 17. You know what I'm saying? Like he's 17 years old. How is he going to be the leader? He said, You really want me to take out a leader in the Prophet's son place? Right? So, again, I'm telling you who's, who's Usama? How special is this guy? Usama is in war. He's a warrior. He's not blood. There's a person fighting him. And this combatant is the only one who's giving him a difficult time as Usama nervous. Everybody else, it was not even a difficult time for him to just clean him one shot. But this guy was giving him a bad. Right? And there was one point where Osama said he almost got a hold of him. He said, because of that, I viciously got up on him and I regained control and now I had the, my, I, I won the, the sword part of it and I had it. And right before I was about to take that final blow, he said, What? Why? Osama's rationale is five seconds ago you would have done the same thing. Right? Five seconds ago, you would have done the same thing to me. You did this to save your life. So he went, he applied his own discretion against what's a general principle, and that is when someone asks you for mercy, even if they were fighting you five seconds ago, you don't allow them. You, you, you don't allow them to be killed by you. You just give them amnesty. You deal with whatever needs to be dealt with in terms of whether their intentions are true or not later. Capture them or whatever, and figure all that stuff. You don't kill them if someone asks for mercy. So he violated this principle based off of a personal discretion, which unfortunately, I mean, or unfortunately, we're all human beings. We can kind of relate to it. Right? That, like, look, if I were in a similar position, I don't know if I would act differently. Because I'm so scared. This is where I want to get back up and fool me and trick me. They used to have a famous saying back in, uh, in the ancient era land, the Hulu Hukka. Right? War is just deception. So again, Osama understands these principles of warfare, the non-Islamic ones, and he applies those. That Habukhuda, war is deception, this guy is trying to deceive me. He went against a principle of Rasulullah said them, and it's a mistake for Osama, for a principle that he believed was more valuable for the cause. You get what I'm saying? You get where I'm getting at? Our approach is right so in today's time. He went against a principle laid out by Rasulullah said for something that he felt was more beneficial to the cause. So now this incident gets reported back to the Prophet Wasallam, who everyone thought would have evaluated that. Ah, this is somebody who made a mistake, he's young, he'll learn. Right? He uh, made a mistake, this guy, he actually became Muslim, he went to Jannah. No, he wants to deal. So a uh, casualty of war. The Prophet Wasallam looks to himself and says, this is true, what they're telling. So yeah, it's true. Rabbi al he said, so why do you do? He's, he's getting angry. Ya Rasulullah, he said it to save his life. I, I, he, he was going to kill me. This is, now, that's why I told you who Osama was. Look what Rasulullah says to his beloved little child. He never, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, never mean, is, he's not mean. He's always merciful. Even if someone is an enemy, he's merciful. But look what he says. He says sarcastically in a cold tone, Allah you should have opened his heart, cut open his heart and see if there's a sign in there or not while you were Did you really, really just kill him because you thought you were How How are you going to justify that in front of Allah? What if he had actually killed him? How do you know what's inside of his heart? Osama, you don't violate principles. He said that, he said, Osama was reporting this incident. He said, I felt like I wanted to sink in there. He said, I felt like I had just become Muslim recently and I didn't actually know about warfare rules or something. He said, I really wish that I had been a new Muslim that knew nothing about Islam at that time, but because I knew better, I felt that burn that the Prophet really held me accountable for something that everyone understood that this is an actual mistake. An actual mistake because the principle was violated. Again, you don't violate our principles. The principle is you don't 
SubhanAllah, engage in warfare with people who are not trying to fight you or not trying to hurt you. Secondly, uh, the prisoners of war thing. If there are prisoners of war, you treat them with the same exact level of respect as you would treat yourself and your families. The way it was implemented in real time by the companions of the Prophet was they actually took it up a notch. And they would actually treat their prisoners a little bit better. Now, how then does it make sense for a group of people who didn't have shoes to, one year after the Prophet walk into the Persian White House, the Persian uh, Muslim as you know, the owners of it? It doesn't make sense. It's literally like saying like the smallest group of people is not going to take over the superpower of the world. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't work with the sword because they didn't have enough swords. It doesn't work with horses. People say it's not spreading with the sword. What sword, man? There's, there's like 5,000 on this side. There's 200,000 on the other side. What sword? People said the Sahaba, you know how their style was of engagement? Right after the war, they were like, I wouldn't be like you because they're surprised. Like, you, why are you treating us this way? Dude, at borderline me, like, cringing the whole time. Like, why are you treating us this way? And then he's like, I mean, our prophet talks to I mean, some Sahaba will call him, like, I don't want to treat you this way, but my prophet so sort of taught me to, I can't disobey him. And that's why, again, you see the weirdest of people, the most random of people, and also sometimes even the most vile of people becoming the heaviest supporters of Islam. That's what turned Khalid bin Walid from Sayfu Quraysh, the sword of Quraysh that caused the Prophet one of the greatest distress. He says there was no day upon me harder than the day of Muhammad. Who caused Uhud to Rasulullah All of them, but primarily the wit of Khalid bin Walid. And Khalid bin Walid goes from that because the Prophet didn't say, oh Khalid, you cost me my uncle, you cost me this, you mutilated our body, you did this. No, he said to Walid and Walid, his brother, he's like, oh Walid, why don't you tell Khalid when he's going to join us? Khalid, where are you at? Because Khalid at this point was really thinking about it. Because he's like, well, he was really, how did he become Muslim? This is very important. I gotta say this. How did Khalid become Muslim? In the Battle of the Trench, he was the only one he was about to make it over that trench. But he stopped because he saw the Prophet while he was still leading his companions in the prayer of war. That's another principle of war. His prayer is you don't sacrifice. And principles of engagement here too. I mean, those of us who are not Muslim, of course you don't have to, you can just watch the Muslims. But if you're at a protest and you miss your salah, then you miss the whole point of the protest. There's literally no good of you being there. Wallah. Khalid bin Walid, he saw the Prophet وسلم, the way it was graceful, the graceful exchange of one party guarding, one party praying, Rasulullah in the middle of them, not moving from Salah, no matter how many arrows are hitting them. Arrows are hitting one, and in Salah, one Sahabi is moving up that way. When Khalid saw this, and he's a military genius, he's like, what? How can these people be so organized? He said, that moment, Islam already contemplated the seat in my heart. And when the Prophet did not hold him accountable for all the stuff that he did in Uhud, that he said, Walid, where is Khalid? That was the icing on the cake, and that's where now one of the greatest assets against Islam, because of a military principle being implemented correctly, became the greatest assets for Islam. That's how that happens. So again, these are a brief synopsis of certain uh, you know, engagements. There's like again, many more, but I'm, I'm not here to give you like a, a, a whole list where you, if I were to hear do that, I would have a you know PowerPoint and give everybody notes. But these are just a few talking points. They just kind of get a person to see a different narrative, a different picture than the way than the one that's painted by the Western media. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Brother Sultan. I'm not gonna lie, I was with Sultan for like two days in BC and um his knowledge his I told you like chat GPC that he's been informed. So it's like, it, you know, when so much Allah, much Allah. I will say this because we want to try to keep it short because we want people to engage and ask questions. This is, you know, this is a teaching, but it's also a QA. We want to hear questions, we want to hear feedback, right? So, what I'm going to kind of come to summarize the first two things. The first thing we asked was, do you condemn a mess? Okay. I will say now, and I said this earlier to Brother Allah, so I said, what is the difference between state-sponsored terrorism and guerrilla warfare terrorism? Terrorism is terrorism no matter who's doing it. They project things on us that they're doing to us, and we 
tend to fall in line with their narrative. The reason why we fall in line with their narrative is because we do not have enough knowledge regarding their propaganda. And that is why at an early age, as what does it mean? It is incumbent upon us to be people of action and not only educate ourselves about the deen, which to me is more important. After like looking more into the deen and learning about the rules of war and learning about the reason why to go to war and how we should end, I'm like, forget the ICC, forget the United Nations. I like this. This is the way it should be. But obviously we need to understand all aspects of all arenas and who we're speaking to, right? So I'll say I'm going to summarize this real quickly regarding these two subjects. Terrorism, killing innocent civilians, it's not okay, no matter who's doing it. If someone is telling you, you condemn this or you condemn that, ask them, you condemn 75 years of occupation, you condemn fake weapons of mass destruction at all, you condemn thousands and hundreds of thousands of people getting get killed in Vietnam so you can steal their resources and destroy their industries and enslave their people. Do I condemn Western imperialism? Do you condemn Western imperialism? I'll condemn that. Okay, I'll condemn what you want me to condemn. But you condemn this too. And mean it. Okay? So educate yourself. Don't be afraid. But you need that little bit of knowledge. And it starts with the fitra within us, as Muslim and mashallah, as the Shaykh said, we have our rules. Live by them and understand and learn their rules as well. Right? Inshallah. So we're going to go on to the next question. This one is a little bit unique um, as a Palestinian because we hear the word Israel, we hear the fact that they've been there for thousands of years and they have history there. It's like, how do you answer this question, right? So I have a question for Brother Sultan, and um, it goes like this, Bismillah. Um, so what is the story and significance of Bani Israel in the Quran? And is there any relevance as to what's happening today in modern day Palestine? You make a good friend, so you let the question out perfectly, mashallah. I wrote it down, that's why. I do. That's what they do too. <laughs> mashallah. No, um, if you want to know, because again, before I go into explaining, you like, bro, we gotta, we gotta like, go to the next question. So do you want me to give everyone like a whole breakdown of, of who are the like even in general and where they come from? And, what they mean when they say we live there? Yeah, so the tribe of Bani Israel, the first temple, and just um, how these Zionists and essentially who, don't... Who, who they were throughout yeah, the Yeah, who they were just essentially, and how they okay. they claim they are Bani Israel today. Okay, Bani Israel, what does Bani Israel mean? Bani Israel is the tribe of... Uh, no, no, what does it mean? The Arabic phrase, Bani Israel. It's an Arabic phrase. What do you mean? Bani Israel. What oh, the, 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 the yeah, like the children of Israel. The yeah. children of Israel, yeah. right? So, so we need to understand, if we want to understand something, you got to know what it means, right? Bani Islaki, who are Bani Islaki? The children of Islaki, we know what children are. What is Islaki then? Okay? What is Islaki? You know what I'm saying? Because there's a lot of Muslims that I also see. Like, not Muslims saying this, I understand, because they don't know. I see a lot of Muslims going around, you know, making parodies of the name in order to vent their frustration. The second part, I understand, and I take frustration. But the first part, doing it however you want to without knowing what you're doing or saying, that part we have to be very careful about because Islam is actually the literal name of the Prophet Yaqub It is his actual name. Allah refers to him throughout the entire Quran with Yaqub a few times and Islam more times. Allah called him by the name Israel, the Prophet Yaqub, who they say in English, Jacob. We Allah called him by the name Israel more than he called him by the name of Yaqub, his actual name. Now, Israel is Yaqub by the name. Israel, what does it mean if you were to make an equivalent out of it in Arabic? Israel would be the equivalent of Abd, and he would be the equivalent of Allah. Okay, so that whether it was ancient Hebrew or ancient Akkadian, that you could dispute that. But it was a different language. But what it meant, its equivalent is Isa is Abd, and Eid is Allah. 
Israel and his own is Abdullah. What does the Prophet say about Abdullah? Ahabu al Asma'i ila Allahi, Abdullah, Abdul Rahman. The most beloved names of Allah to Allah are Abdullah and Abdul Rahman. So now, if a person says something making fun of that name, in essence, they are making fun of all of this. You get what I'm saying? It's very important for us to know what we're doing as Muslims. We don't know we to have as we just be doing things because everyone else is doing it. So you know, no, we don't have anything against the name Islam. That is actually the name of one of my mightiest prophets, Allah, Ya'qub Ayyazan. Who are the Bani Islamin? People understand them as the followers of Musa Ayyazan, but it goes way before that because they're the children of Israel. Who is Israel? Ya'qub Ayyazan. Where was Ya'qub Ayyazan situated? Does anyone know? Where did he live? Once upon a time, there used to be a man named Ya'qub Ayyazan. Where did he live? Haraq. Hmm? Haraq? Kanaan. 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 Where is Kanaan? Modern day, yeah, modern day Palestine. Yeah, yeah. that area, right in front of it. So now, Yaqub Ali is in Canaan. Yaqub Ali is in has 12 sons. Do you see it? Huh? What area? Canaan. Canaan is in Palestine. I'm not sure exactly the map exactly where, but that's that area. So Yaqub Ali is in this. How did he get there? He traveled there. He wasn't living there originally. Who is Yaqub Ali is in? Can anyone tell me real quick? Your father and Yusuf, but another relation. Who is his daddy and granddad? It's Harak and then Ibrahim. So now we're going back to the Abrahamic case. Is it Judaism, Christianity, Islam? Ibrahim, Ibrahim, where was he? He was in Mecca. So he was in Mecca. He came from Iraq, from Mesopotamia, moved to Mecca. He's established himself in Mecca. And now, as after later on, his mission evolved to now leave Mecca towards the, the, the lands, even with Lut alayhi salatu that's why Lut alayhi salatu wasalam's residing in the war was there too. When we were there in Philistine, we visited there too. The only eerie area of all the Philistine was that Sodom and Gomorrah area. Right? So, subhanAllah, Lut alayhi salam is there, Ibrahim alayhi salam is there, they're settled there, they moved there. And now, Yaqub alayhi salam is just their project. He's living from Muslim, settled by his father's house. Now his children are Yusuf, Ali and Salam, Yabuti Joseph, Binyamin. Binyamin is Yusuf's real brother. So from one mother is Yusuf and Binyamin. Binyamin is Benjamin. Okay? Benjamin. Whatever. Binyamin. They named him after him. Binyamin Yusuf Ali Salam's real brother from Yaqub. Now he has another wife, and from her he has ten other sons. Ten those ten other sons, I don't remember all their names, but Allah refers to them in the Quran. That's how we know. Because all of our information, the only one that we deem authentic is the one that we get directly from Ubud Ali. And the details above and beyond that, we deem them not very necessary or relevant. Like you talked about what is relevant to us. We don't deem them relevant firstly. And secondly, uh, we, don't, we don't act like we know all the details. We just know what Allah tells us. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us these people when the whole incident, everyone I'm sure read the story of Yusuf and Yaqub what went down. This is actually the story that gives a lot of hope, a lot of healing to the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But what happens is Yusuf's brothers, long story short, kidnapped Yusuf away from his father. His father loved him so much he didn't want him to go away to go race. That's where they came. They initially duped. He's but he's like initially duped their dad, right? The actual literal of the Islam, the children of the actual Islam, he went to Islam, he duped their dad, saying that the heaven had a set of oil, and he used to enter the night of the Islam. They said, Oh Allah, oh Father, let us go race. He said, No, no, I fear that a wolf might eat him. Right? That's what the father said. One to one, while you guys are not watching. Right? And then what did they say? That in Akhla Uthid, who are not your Osba, if a, 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 a wolf and he does devour him, and we're a large group of people, there are 10 people, 10 brothers, and we couldn't stop a wolf from eating our brother, it didn't matter the Hazim who were really like, we really took a hell at that point. Hazim who literally means losers. You know what I'm saying? Literally, that's like, at that point, we don't understand any punishments, right? So now, Yaqub says, hesitating, very, he just acquiesced. At the very least, it was the act, at the very most, sorry, it was an acquiesced. Take him. Took him, you know what they did. Took him, pretended to play with him, threw him in a well. So the initial piece on he took their own brother and threw him in a well. You know what I'm saying? So if you feel like, you know what I'm saying, mercy is something that you know human beings have always shown and they only just lost it recently. No, no, no. Uh, this kind of existed even in the actual children of the prophets. So they took him, threw him in the well, and Yusuf is picked up from that well and he's taken to Egypt. That's how they ended up in Egypt. 
Okay, I'm going to skip past the whole story. Yusuf was picked up from the well and taken to Egypt, sold as a slave there. And then Yusuf's whole life in Egypt was between slander and, and difficulty and tribulation for 40 years, spending his life in a prison cell. You know what I'm saying? All freedom fighters, if you think about it, like, wow, the Yusuf party said, oh, was that? He was there and he saw the system of Egypt. Was that correct? Because literally, he got locked up for a crime he didn't commit. So in his head, Yusuf Ali Islam's head, the whole time while he's in jail, I'm going to establish goodness on this earth. I'm going to fix up Egypt. Right? That's what he wanted to do the whole time, which is why as soon as he came out of jail, the first thing he did was not, no, no, I'm not just free. I want to actually summon everybody who accused me. Right away, he's establishing a system in Egypt of justice. This random little Ghani boy that was thrown in a well is establishing a system of justice as he comes out of jail. Call all those ladies who made this lie up, this slander up that I, that I tried to advance against this woman. Bring them all. And he asked all of them, he interrogated all of them, do you guys know anything about me that I would do this? Now I am not in Oh, we lie. Yeah, we hid the truth. That's what they do. But we hide the truth. You know what I'm saying? We hid the truth. We don't know anything wrong about it. And now Yusuf is finally free. He earns his freedom through the principal way. Right? He stays in jail and he has to stay in jail even though it's, it was wrong. Right? But when he comes out, right away, the first thing is, ah, I'm not going to go hug my dad. I'm going to go establish justice. I'm not even going to look for my dad. I'm going to establish justice where I am. That's the principle of Muslim. Now he stays there in Egypt and right away he understands that the only way to get Egypt back together in line is because what we're, what we're really strong in is our economy. So he says, The price that I want for all these years that y'all took away from my life is, Make me the treasurer of Egypt. Because I'm very protected, I know what I'm doing, I mean, I know I have knowledge about this. So right away, that was the price that he asked for when he got his ring and when he came out of it. Now, if you think about it, the person who's now going to bring and restore goodness to Egypt, especially if you think about it, what was happening in the world at that time, even Canaan went through a drought and famine and all of those things, everything around it was suffering. Because of Yusuf Islam holding it down through his prowess in Egypt, everyone is now flocking to Egypt, and Yusuf Islam is the center of attention, even though he's not the actual king. I'm going to make reference to this when he asks me the question about how do we engage in politics now. Right? Yusuf Ali Islam now is, even though he's not the king, it's equivalent to having the power of a king. So that's what the Bani Israel, the actual son of Israel, who's in Egypt, he's establishing his royal presence there through that avenue. But because he wasn't an actual king, he needs to pay attention to all the details that I'm telling you, all the details, details, every little detail matters. Because Yusuf Ali Islam was not actually in the real position that he was an emperor of Egypt or the medical king of Egypt, eventually when regimes changed, that second classness of Yusuf that he was originally brought to Egypt as a Palestinian, as a Ghanani, is now restored. Now, it's not that the only, I had to the Quran is actually the only book, not the Bible, that differentiates between the title of the king at the time of Yusuf and the title of the king at the time of Musa Yusuf. That the title of Quran, they were referred to as kings, not as pharaohs. It was a different regime at that time. Which is why we don't see the systems of killing babies and apartheid and all the stuff that Quran had going on. We don't see it employed in the reign of Yusuf Islam. In the reign of Yusuf Islam, it was all just like drama, you know, saying like, you know, scandals and this and that, you know, saying like ladies coming up with scandals and, and, and throwing banquets after it and doing this and this. That's, that's all was going on in Yusuf Islam. That's what he had to fix. It wasn't like systematic with oppression, like, you know. Yusuf Islam passes away and now years pass by. The tyrannical pharaoh regime takes over Egypt. Now Egypt is revolutionized in their mentality by the pharaohs. Farah'i now we refer to them in Arabic. Now these Farah'i now, one of them, one of them who had the longest reigning empire, like the longest reigning kingdom. And after him, it, it goes to, 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 to waste in Red Sea, right? He was the pharaoh at the time of Musa Whether his name was the, the, the one that starts with the N or Ramesses II, that's disputed. That's not important to us because the title of what he was and who he represented is what matters to us. Allah, do you know he speaks about Musa 
four, 147 times in the Quran. If you pick up the Quran, any page you, you open up is going to be maybe Musa or Fir'aun or something. If Allah in our book, our most important, an important book is telling us about this guy, and telling us about this regime, and telling us about this ancient Egyptian civilization. It means it's a great deal of blessing for us to learn. So now Fir'aun, when he comes and he takes over, his enslavement mechanism of the Bani Israel is very similar to his ancestors of the Fir'aun, but he's the one who upped it to all the notches that Allah talks about in the Quran. And I'm going to briefly mention each of them. Allah says, Fir'aun ibn Awdad. Awdad is he had a large army, and he would take little units of them and pick them into all of them. Inna Fir'auna ka'alatum wa ja'ala ahlaha shi'a. Yes, so I do a lot of You can pick up now who is saying, he's out, who can be Muslim. So his style was, he would separate the people. The Egyptians go here, and he's like, go here. The first thing of, like, this people belong here, and these people belong here, totally apart from each other. Started by this guy, right? So that's how he started his control. And then that was a new thing that he implanted one of his units of that army. He pegged them on all of those settlements of the Bani Israel that he started in his regime. He happened to watch, watch it very, very closely. And I had flashes of all of these verses as I was walking in the streets of Khalid myself, of Hegwa. For those of us who know, it's a Palestine right now. As I was walking the streets of Khalid, there's cones here, Muslims walk here, Jews walk here. And the cones in my head, like, yo, like the cones are done, maybe apartheid is done too. So I was actually in from the Masjid of Ibrahim where he is laid to rest. I'm driving like my little baby stroller down the street, and I'm like, okay, the cones are done. Now I have a little more space to wiggle around the strollers, mighty stroller. And I move a little bit to the side, and how many soldiers? The whole, my, my wife saw them this, right? She always, that's her favorite story to tell people, right? They, they all of them walked out with their guns. The actual heavy machinery and me and my child on the shoulder. Right? Because I crossed over onto their side by accident. And then all these little Palestinian children, you know, and then that side, you know, you know, and I was scared, man. So that's what he would do. He would pack those guys, and then they would have cameras installed in people's homes. You know what I'm saying? You're just trying to you know, answer the call of nature. You know what I'm saying? You're just trying to. And then now somebody watching you. You get what I'm saying? That's, that's exactly. I didn't, I'm not reporting to you by his recording. I've seen this with my eyes. And all as I was watching this, that's why it's important for me to not hear it to all of you. The verses of the Quran were sitting in my head. And Allah said that this is what this guy did to you. Right? He had that, he had the system of any time anybody wanted to visit his kingdom, he had propaganda prepared. But he saw he have come here, you need to have you bitch come in ugly come. They want to drive you out of your land. That was his propaganda. This fancy Bariqa Ikum al Musta. Yet the head of your Bariqa Ikum al Musta. The system that you have of democracy, of freedom, this Egypt, he really wanted to make it monumental. People have their theories about pyramids. I don't know what it is. I'm going to ask Allah to show me how they're made on the agenda. But I have a theory because Allah says, Fir'aun says in the Quran, Ya Haman, O Haman, Ibn Bi Soha, build for me a mighty monument, Lagi Abdullah al Salaam, so I can go up to the skies. And Salaam Samal wa Afa, look at Ibn 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 Musa, so I can go look at Musa's God. Because I think Musa's lying, built for me such mighty monuments that I can climb up there and go see Musa's God. Right? So again, he wanted to make Egypt a landmark for mankind, civilization to be remembered for ages. And in a certain way, he kind of did that. So now, what he had as a standard propaganda is these savages, these Bani Islamic savages who have no control over themselves, these barbarians, these people who, like, you know, and Musa I'm going to tell you what he did. These people who kill innocent people, they don't deserve to have any kind of freedom because if they have freedom, they'll let loose on our population and destroy all of them and all the civilization we have going on here. So that was the standard thing of what he did to the Bani Islamic. Musa I came, he saved them from all of that. Across the Red Sea, now they're inside. Now, but he said, you would have thought that after being saved with this guy, they come back to their senses and actually start worshiping God. But then, as soon as Allah says, what that was that you're going to be saying? That fat, that one letter is so important to me. Allah says, we took the Bani Islam right across the ocean, we slipped the whole ocean with them, right? Like, that's crazy, that is amazing, that is a miracle that Allah has just didn't give to many people. So now, Allah says they, they get across the ocean, as they're just traveling, 
They come across a group of people like that are not of seven them that were worshiping idols. Instead of saying like, oh man, I feel bad for these people. Had they only known that Allah who saved us in his miraculous way through Musa and Islam's teachings. Instead of saying that, they're like, oh, this man, cool. Yeah, Musa, Musa, you see how you do doing all your worship? That's not cool. Make, make for us a God like that too. Musa, I said, what? In the Qumqawmun that you Allah actually documents his response. He said, y'all are ignorant. What? How can you say that? Allah has literally saved you from this most heretical regime ever. Caught you over the ocean, and now as soon as you see something cool that's not Allah anymore, that you want to flop to the coolness of the world? Right? You would have thought that now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala noticed that Fir'aun kept them hungry and starving, clothed and clothed naked, no clothes, nothing. Now Allah, what is he doing for them? And then said, Allah alayhi wa sallam, we're sending them heavens. Allah started sending them food directly prepared in Jannah and sending them divinely owned. He said, Musa, um, Musa, we, uh, we have a lot of to grow some things from the earth. We need some lentils, bro. Like, we need some onions. Don't we want to cook too? Allah says, I said, Sadiq, you really now want something other than Jannah food too? Jannah food is not enough for you? So subhanAllah, oh my god, these many is like, again, you, you would have thought, but it didn't end up good. Now, Musa Islam had this whole encounter with these people. There were some from amongst them that were outstanding and really good people, and a lot from amongst them. This behavior of theirs was a theme throughout the existence of the Prophet Musa Islam. Musa Islam finally passes away, and his prodigy is a person by the name of Yusha ibn Nun. Yusha ibn Nun is translated in English to Joshua. So now he's the prophet of the Bani Islam. The Bani Islam had many, many, many prophets. Most of the prophets were from Bani Islam. Right? The thing is, we don't know about many of their stories because whenever they didn't like them, they just murdered them. You know what I'm saying? Like, just like, ah, I don't like you guys killed me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whenever a prophet, you know, would just to come to you and tell you to be just, why is it that you just killed him? Right? So these people didn't shy away from killing prophets. You get what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's a pattern. So now, Yusha ibn Nun is struggling with these people, and these people are now back just wandering and going around the world. There was one time, Musa Ali's, sorry, this is re relevant. This, this, this answer is probably going to be the longest, and then after that, we're going to give one more answer to Loki my back kill in the future. Musa Ali is giving these people one chance. They're roaming around the Sinai Desert right now, right? He gave them one chance that if you want to go back home, where is their home? They're in Egypt through all of these other things I told you. Yusuf Ali Islam enslaved right here, treasure. Oh, now they're here. We used to like uh, Musa Ali Islam. Y'all want to go home? Where's home? Philippines. Uh, right? Now, if you want to go home, let's visit, let's, let's, let's ask Allah how you are. So Allah says, Musa, you need to tell them to go fight. Because the people who are occupying the Philistine after Yaqub Islam departed and his family was on from there, the famine kind of drove them. The people who are occupying that land, Quranic terminology calls them Jabbarin. Jabbarin is not their name, it's their title of what type of tyranny they will carry out. Jabbarin is those who oppose every, every, every strand of normalcy and impose tyranny, right? Jabbarin to force. Tyranny down someone's throat. That's Jabari. So Allah called in the Piyah of Jabari. Right? There is Jabari people. Who are Jabari people? Does anyone know? Jabari. Amal. The guy said, Oh, they, they are just like, remember what Amalek has done to you? Amal. They are Jabari. Musa Ali is telling them he's like, let's go fuck these Amalek people and take back their home. What they told Musa Ali is that? This is the verse of the Quran. Yeah, Musa, it had that the whole book of God, yeah, and I have not time. Musa, you and your God will fight. We're going to sit right here. Musa, Allah oh, said He's going to give you that land, bro. Like, what? what? Allah's going to help you. You know, Allah is helping you. No, Musa, it's tough. So now, there's only two people who kind of wanted to go and Allah single these people out and said, no, these two. But he's like, well, good, but every one of them. So they didn't enter. So Allah says, Arba'in and Fain and Ham, Haram and Dunayim, Arba'in. Now this land that could have been yours, 
his home that once used to be yours, could have been yours, is now Muharramatun Alayhim. It is now haram for you for 40 years. Yet you want to go roam around the earth, go look for a home in Sinai, and you don't have a, you don't have a home for yourself. Right? But that, that's not a home investing. When you open these sin against Allah, that's what happens. So when they didn't trust Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, during the life of Musa they didn't get to go back home. Now in the time of the Prophet Yusha alayhi wa sallam, Yusha alayhi wa sallam tried his best, but he also passed away without having much accomplished. Now there's another Prophet by the name of Hizqid alayhi wa sallam. Not many people know him, but he's referred to in Surah Al-Baqarah. Hizqid alayhi wa sallam was now the current Prophet. The, how many Prophets passed in between, we don't know. But during the era of the Prophet Hizqid alayhi wa sallam, but he, so he really got his hands, and he said, O oh, Prophet of God, please make dua to Allah if Afghana Malik and Nuhadil fi Send for us a king that we can now use to go and fight. Give us a leader. We need a leader so that we can go fight. Because they realize this whole time they're not getting anywhere because they're not listening to their leader and they don't have a strong leader. So now, in their head, a prophet, ah, this guy's a religious guy. What do religious people know? You know what I'm saying? That, that, was, that, that was their attitude. What do religious people know? Uh, give us a king. Give us a real leader. That's not a prophet I don't understand, but give us a leader. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, he understands that these people are just being ignorant. So he says, all right, you really want a leader? No problem. I'll give you a leader. So now when they get the leader, Allah says his name was Balut. Balut, when he's appointed by the same, the Prophet Ali is the leader of the army, who's now going to fight years after Musa Ali Islam had already passed away. Now they say, oh, Balut. I'll be the leader. But I'm not going to be the We have more knowledge than him, and we actually have more actual knowledge. Like, very basically flexing their qualifications. Ah, we're, we're better qualified than Baloot. Who's this Baloot guy? This is like this random guy, Baloot, and you're just going to throw anybody in, and we want to hear, and you're just going to give it to anybody. No, give us someone better. Let's see, I'm just going to You know what I'm saying? Like, when you say that, you really don't, don't have much to say back to that. So then, now, the Bani Israel are like, oh, well, we got our leader, we got a leader that we don't want. What do we do? The leader says, let's go out, let's go out and fight, let's go out and you know take our land back against these Amadab. Their tyranny is crazy right now. So now when they go out, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends Salud because Salud is mad nervous. He's like, you know, these people, if they if I heard what they said, I don't know if they're gonna actually follow through with this whole like war thing. So he he didn't know what to do, so Allah was like, give him a litmus test. So Allah actually sends him a litmus test. The litmus test is, all you have got to go by this massive river will be very, very thirsty, and the command of Allah is to not drink, to control your thirst. Right? Let's see if you can control your thirst. Right? That was your test. Allah says they all drank. They all didn't control, control their thirst, except for a small group of amongst them. And then now, when Baluk has a small, tiny, little, sifted out army from this large group of Israel, Bani Israel, who kind of galvanized and got together and became activists and they want to go and take our land back. And now they don't want to go. And when the right group was weeded out from amongst them, Allah says, now Baluk advances, he advances, he advances, and gets the full seniors. Amalifah there, Amalifah there are ready for war. Because they're, that's all they know warfare, tyranny, bloodshed, they're ready. I mean, they got not tanks, but they got a dude who's a tank. Okay? Who's this dude? Jalut. In English, Goliath. David and Goliath. Hmm? Jalut. Jalut is a tyrant. He's huge. His, his, his physical stature depicts his tyranny, and everybody is terrified to fight him because prior to warfare, what uh, the Amalekha would also do, like many, many, in, in many wars, is they would do duels before him. Duels, like between the leaders, that like now I'm saying, now I just merge your leader, now I'm going to eat your army apart. Right? So, subhanAllah, Jalut does the same thing. Anybody who's going to fight me, now everybody from amongst that army is scared and terrified. And the Bani Sa'id, even the formidable Bani Sa'id, are like, this guy, I mean, we did the whole Thursday, but <laughs> this guy, I don't know. Who comes out there? Little foot soldier. He's not nobody to know. Little foot soldier is this Dawood. And he comes out and stops him. Dawood's so tiny, now he's like, I'm compared to this big guy. I don't know what I'm going to do. This big tank. Yeah. Here's a rock. Here's a rock. I'm going to see if folks see each other. Little rock. Whoop it at the time. It's not a rock. 
الله عز وجل وقدم لنا وقوم وجعلونا وعافاه الله والملك والحكمه وعلمه مما يشاء. يعني داوود كيرز جعلوه مثلا داوود كيرز جعلوه مثلا داوود الله الله كيرز الله عز وجل ما رميت اي رميت ولكن الله رمى. When the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was there was an attempt to assassinate him against him and he threw the dust and it went into all of their eyes, blinding them and putting them to sleep in his knees. Allah says, You didn't throw that dust when you threw that dust, we threw that dust. You have to remember where it's coming from. If you lose focus on where help is coming from and you think it's going to be coming from your organizing, your protests, your, your yelling out things without actually having Allah as part of the equation, those rocks don't have any power in them. And as soon as that happens, Allah, the kingdom of David is now established. The kingdom of Dawood is now established. Allah gives him now wisdom. He teaches him all kinds of things to now fortify this mighty, mighty kingdom of Dawood. How easy does Allah make it for Dawood? He makes iron so soft for him. Then he can literally take a piece of metal and curve it around and make chain metal like that. We made iron soft for him. And then we said, Dawood, this is also another gift from amongst us. Our gifts he made his voice beautiful. So now when he sings the praises of Allah, it's not just humans who gather around him. It's not just a powerful empire. It's deeply spiritual as well because the king is leading not just the humans, but even the animals and birds in the the king, Dawood this is the real king David. This is not what they depict him to be. You get what I'm saying? This is Dawood when he establishes his kingdom, that's what that, that justice in that kingdom is now Allah says, Well, what if that's Sulaiman Dawood? Well, call it, Yahya, you had not surrounded him to the complaint, but Utina and Kuli Shaykh in the head of the Hulk of Mubin. Well, Hushia and Sulaiman, Jamukhu in the Jinni, well, Insi, well, Tayyi, Fahu, Zaroon. Now Sulaiman inherits all of that. Sulaiman Aisam, Solomon's temple. Sulaiman inherits all that from Nabud Aisam and Sulaiman Aisam. The justice that he established was something that he did his father witness. When there was an incident where a lady came, one authentic thing that we we know about Sulaiman Aisam's governing system was that whole lady when she brought the baby, she's like, ah, oh, she stole my baby. And Sulaiman Aisam, again, he didn't rule based off of you know what he, whatever he saw. He said, you know what, bring me the baby. Let me cut it in half and give you a piece each. And then she said, no, 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 let her have the baby. And she said, that's, that's a mother's heart right there. That's your baby right there. Allah says, we gave him that. We gave him the ability to have such wisdom. We gave him the ability. Allah says, it doesn't come from Sulaiman, but that comes from me. When you were Sulaiman, I said, his dua to Allah, when Lamma Bana Sulaiman, I said, Bait al Maqdis, now we're going to come to the history of what Bait al Maqdis. Sulaiman al-Azam, when he built Masjid al-Aqsa, he asked Allah for three unique things. The first thing was, this thing that just ruling, that, oh Allah, let every ruling come out of my mouth as if it's your command, right? As if you are pleased with it by a, a standard. And then the second thing is that, Oh Allah, give me such a powerful kingdom that no one else will ever have after me. They're trying to now revive this kingdom of Allah. Allah is saying, no, it's not ever going to be revived because he already prayed that nobody else is going to get this. Okay, so all of your attempts to go in and seek that out, futile. He himself prayed against it. That anybody should be able to have what he had, the control over it. That's why we're saying the reverse is what he had. He was able to speak to birds. He had jinns in his control. He had the entire animal kingdom at his control. You know what I'm saying? All the places where, you know what I'm saying? If you go to Aqsa, some people, tour guide will even point out, like, yo, he, he used to lock up them shell in there. Whether that's true or not, Allah, but he did have all of that, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us, that was one of the mightiest kingdoms, actually, the mightiest kingdom of Jerusalem at that time. Sulaiman so, al-Islam now establishes himself in his kingdom, might, it's Bani Israel kingdom. It's justice now. Lots of injustice, lots of tyranny, lots of dhulm, lots of that. Now back to justice. Now, after Sulaiman al Islam passed away, we don't know how, what happens. We don't know how many prophets think him. Because when they go on a killing spree of prophets, God just pauses the story. He doesn't tell you what happened. Then you don't need to go into the dark, no, the darkness of it. We'll let you know what happens. We'll let you know that if you don't hear anything from the prophets after Sulaiman, it's probably because they just killed him. 
And you probably know Rusman, Allah says this very, very directly. Rusman, Allah says, Now, Malik, what Rusman, then the Rusul, Malik, or Kalam Allah, and Musa. There's some messengers that we tell you about, and there's some messengers that we don't tell you about, because not every one of them got to have a story, right? Because of these people. So, nevertheless, now, Sayyidina Ali Sam's just kingdom, now, after this whole thing, it, you know, subhanAllah, dwindles down into now, Isa and Islam situation. Isa and Islam situation, we know what happens there. Isa and Islam situation is now brewing heavy. Christian, Jew, this is now becoming terminology. Before that, it was just the names of the prophets and their followers. There's no such thing as like, yeah, you know, Judaism. No, it's just the name of the prophets and what the prophets taught. These are the followers of Musa. These are the followers of it. and Bani Islam was always a title because that's who they are. They're the children of Islam, right? So now it's, it's not a curse. It's literally a non. They need to like really actually be real Bani Islam. You know what I'm saying? What did Islam even say before he passed away? He said all to all of his children, "What is his main goal for for what he wants from them?" He said, "It's not that we're going to be you want to worship them." And when he got the answer that he wanted, that we're only going to worship Allah, not so many partners with him, he was happy. Abu Ali Sam is like, he died a happy man, knowing that his children said to him that they're going to uphold Allah in his teachings. But some of them did, some of them did not. And by the time, now that's where I'm going to cut a short piece on all the conflicts, now Judaism, Christianity, Byzantine uh, influences, Constantine, all of these political, religious wars are not going on. It's a whole bunch of confusion. Religion is now under attack all throughout the entire world. There's nothing when it comes to religion that is actually thriving. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the Hakim to be Five seventy-one years after the Prophet's life, the Prophet Isaiah Islam has done that past year. After they had tried to kill him as well. They tried to even kill Isaiah. Who are they? They're not Islam. They tried to kill him. Allah said, Allah didn't kill him though. Allah said, Allah didn't kill him though. Allah said, Allah didn't kill him though. Allah said, the matter was made confusing to him. Allah didn't say, oh, they're lying about it. Allah says, they, they just don't know any better because to them they, they thought they did. Right? But Allah said, Allah didn't kill him though. What actually happened is I took him and said to myself, he still would be right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that, and now when Isa is taken back, Allah says now the world needs to have a new law and order. And the reason why all of this bloodshed is happening, if you look at what Allah says is meant for this earth, He says, I want you to be my representatives on this earth. The angels had one objection. They said, oh Allah, this earth was inhabited by other creatures who had free will before this. The jinn. And what did they do? They shed their blood. Oh Allah, why would you let humans do the same thing? Allah says, I know what I know. And then he puts us on this earth, and then human beings are given directives and free will. Now they choose to violate that directive sent to them by God, and Allah then exposes what free will, when it is not tamed by religious and divine instruction, what it leads to. Thereafter, through all of history, now the Prophet says about himself, Me and now the end is here. Now there's not going to be like all these like prophets and empires and this and that. Now me and uh, me and the hour, me and the day of judgment have been sent like this. Which is why the promise of the Quran was not the prophet of uh, Musa Islam's book's prophet. I mean promise. The Allah, Allah didn't put a, a verse in there that says we're going to keep this protected until the day of judgment. Allah did not put a verse inside the Angel gospel that we're going to keep this protected. But there is a verse in our Quran which says, inna we have sent this reminder to the Quran and we will keep it safe. Regardless of what happened historically, politically, no matter how many Qurans they tried to burn, no matter how many people fought they tried to kill, not a single letter has changed for 1440 years. It's not a coincidence. So now, Rasulullah has sent the standard instruction for how that place is to be kept by divine law until the Holy From here on out, we're not going to have now a prophet to come take us back to the promised land. But what do we do have? What do we have? We have an ilm. Sunnah. Sunnah is the tradition, the knowledge, the wealth of knowledge left as a legacy for the, from the Prophet. What did he say? Verily, those people who have knowledge about this deen, about all these happenings, they are the inheritors of the prophets. Why? Because. Because prophets, they don't leave behind gold and silver. They don't leave behind knowledge. A 
person who takes from this knowledge has taken a good portion of goodness. Let's take from this knowledge of the prophet and boy, these principles. And these principles slowly but surely get us back to the promised land. It didn't happen in the time of the prophet, but it sure did happen in the time of Umar bin Khattab. And I'm going to end with this quote. When he walks into Jerusalem, he doesn't walk in as a comfort. He walks in with a red carpet. The people who are handing him over the keys are fanboying him the whole time. So Rome is the grand patriarch is telling him that believe the Allah to set them on place. For a man like this, Jerusalem is just surrendered. You don't even fight. For a man like this, you just hand it over. Why? Because only when he walked in, he was disheveled. His clothes, he had fell into mud, were completely muddy. He had no appearance of a leader. He didn't have a turban on his head. He went with his bald head exposed, blizzing, beaming brightly with the moon of his head and the, and the sun. And he walks in like that, and Abu Ubaidah, who was the leader of the Muslims around at that time, he pulls him to the side and says, Oh, well, at least change your clothes. At least change your clothes. It's a historical moment. Felicity is about to be free for the first time. Even in the Muslim time, he didn't see a free Felicity. He didn't see a free Aqsa. But the first time since his demise, it's about to be an uncall here. There was only dead bodies here, there was only carcasses here. There was 90,000 of them during the Byzantine time, during the Persian time, to the worst. The first time justice is going to happen, I'm going to be change your clothes. He says, Nahnu qawmun a'azan Allahu Abu Ubaidah, I really wish it was somebody other than you who said something like this to me. He said, because of our way, I'm knowing exactly how I am now. We are not a nation that gets our is our honor from, from anywhere else. We get it from Islam. If we go looking for Islam, we go looking for honor, knocking at somebody else's door, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will disgrace us. That's why when he started the question with how is there so many of us? And they're devouring us. They're, they, he literally said they're kicking our butts because the Prophet Muhammad literally said they would. When he said that there's going to come a time when they're going to literally be eating you, like they're eating from a platter. What did they do with that? That sex people think he literally distributed yeah. us. You know what I'm saying? Like, there you go. They're telling them. Literally, they chopped us up. They get crumbs with them. They're, they're, the metaphor that he used was so accurate. They're going to chop you up and distribute you like people distribute food. When the Sahaba were perplexed, they get also, how would they be able to do, a, do that to us? Because the Sahaba saw that the wins they were, they were getting, if we continue like this, we're going to take over the world. So they were like, yeah, Allah, maybe with all this win, the success, people are going to be calling like that. He said, maybe, they all said, maybe that day we're not going to be so many. There's going to be only a few Muslims. The Prophet says, no, no, that's going to be the day where you have there's so many. There's going to be way more of you than there are now. You just won't be able to do anything. Because you're going to be knocking on everybody else's door. We need this leader to stand up. We need this organization to stand up. We need to do this right. We need to include you know, all the sentiments of people who don't think that, like, you know, like Islam and make this more like a. Nah, 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 nah. This is a cause for Allah and Allah only. It's not even a cause for Palestine. Allah, everything is secondary. Palestine, Aqsa, Hazza, everything is secondary. This is a cause for Allah. And if you forget that, Allah is like, alright, figure it out yourself. You know what I'm saying? You don't want me, I won't. I won't. I won't. Allah says, I won't. I won't. I won't. I won't. This way of Islam, you think I'm going to force it down because you don't want it? Yeah, if you want to keep Islam out of your cause for liberation, keep it out and figure it out yourself. And we're trying to figure it out in the Holy Quran. So it's our duty now to go back and really historically through a Quranic lens study when Allah has given victory, when Allah has given defeat. And what we were doing around that time, so that we can learn to not do the dumb things of the people who did dumb things, and we can learn to do the smart things of the people who did smart things. Like the Prophet Uta said to his people, Is there one smart person who wants to make us from amongst those who are washing? Amen. Peace be. Those who are intelligent, and his path. Bye. Amen. Peace be. Allah is Akbar. me personally, the journey that I've been on is always a bit. It's, I've always taken the Western civilization's word 
and kind of follow that, right? Not that I don't believe in our fitra, our religion, our beliefs. But what I've done is like, okay, this has been working for this, you know, Western liberal society for what, like 100 years or so. And I started studying and looking back at, at our stories. And subhanAllah, like if you listen to the stories of Musa Islam, Ben Shapiro was on the Joe Rogan show, right? You guys know who Ben Shapiro is? Yeah. Yeah. So he was on the Joe Rogan show. And Joe Rogan asked him the question, like, well, did Moses split the sea for you guys? Or whatever it was, it was like a religious question. And Ben Shapiro goes, well, you know, it's, uh, it was like a tide that day or something, and it was a wind blow, and I guess they were able to walk. You know, that's how we talk. So it's like, he basically dismissed his own beliefs, right? Where they were able to be free, right? Because of the Prophet Musa, right? This is what you're dealing with. The apartheid that you're seeing right now, it's happened in history. It's not the first time, right? Segregation, it's happened in history. Injustice, it's happened throughout history. Um, our goal is to understand who we are, right? And how to approach it the Islamic way and serve justice wherever it is, it is in the world, right? You know, you can't kill cancer with cancer. You know, you can't kill cancer with cancer. Uh, maybe you can, I don't know, they haven't cured cancer, but as far as I know, if you're telling me to use imperialistic laws, right, that serve imperialism to fix our issues as an ummah and around the world, and just, uh, it's not just an ummah issue, yeah, our ummah is extremely important to us, but there's injustice everywhere right now. We don't hear about it, but it's everywhere. Like I said, Haiti, which is like literally right there. I had no idea that Haiti was essentially the Africa and minerals of the West. Oh, that's why we have military compounds everywhere. That's why Haiti can't have a president. That's why Haiti can't use their resources. That's why Haiti's got cancers and shambles. Like, as Muslims mean, just because they're not Muslims, it doesn't mean we shouldn't care about their plight. The only thing is, we have to know ourselves first. We have to know what made us successful at one point. And if you want to follow Western civilization's laws, go for it. Have fun. Get us to the table. I'm cool with it. We need, we need every avenue we can take. But don't make that your main reason for any cause. And don't make that the only way that you view these causes. Now, this is the, re the main reason why I really want this sit in motion. Like, what he was teaching right now, we would probably need like a, a two-week course on that. Like, with the story of Bani Yisrael and the it's not going to happen in 10, 15 minutes. But we do want to get to a Q&A as well, right? So, my goal today, personally and selfishly, was not to approach the Palestinian issue from a, a land, political, geopolitical issue. My goal today is to figure out why the Ummah is so weak. Why are they bullying us? Why? It's not because of Bush and Cheney, and it's not because of Ariel Sharon or Benjamin Netanyahu, who wouldn't even handle a flick if you flicked them with your own finger. It's not because of that. You know? It's because we are weak internally. So I, for myself, know this. I know I have a lot of work to do. I know it. And I'm not going to change the world. I'm not, I know that. But what I want to do is change myself, take care of my family, figure out my family, and then inshallah, help spread information to the future generations so that the Pakistani and the Indian and the Moroccan and the Palestinian and the Arab and the non-Arab and the Colombian and the Chilean and wherever they are in the world, if they're Muslim, you're part of that Ummah. And if you're not a Muslim, we don't stand up for your injustice. Because as Muslim mean, we're people of action. We're not people of just, hey, let's sit back and be complacent, open up businesses, make a little bit of money, work on a nine to five job, you know, make a few hundred K a year, whatever it is. And oh, uh, yeah, I'm good. I got a car, I got a house. I'm good. Who cares what's going on with everybody else? Guess what, people? It's coming for you, actually. It's kind of coming for you. But it's not this decade, it's not this generation. 100%. Your grandkids, if you stay complacent, are going to get. 
the worst of the worst when it comes to what's coming. So we need to understand ourselves so that way, the internet, that we can fight injustice with the fitra of not relying on our dignity and our humanity to come from Western imperialism. It doesn't come from them. Our honor does not come from Western imperialism. I'm sorry to tell you that. It does not. So if you're thinking you're going to get, you know, John down the street to like you because, you know, you tell him you're a Democrat or a Republican, they don't care. Unfortunately, Americans, Americans themselves don't even know why they're not able to get free health care. They don't know why you're not able to pay your teachers. They don't know why uh, uh, people go broke because of medical bills. Or, or if they do, they're too lazy to do anything about it. And it's supposed to mean we can't. We can't be inactive. So the next question I have, it's an important one, and thank you, Brother Sultan, I know you're going through a little back pain right now. Um, and I want to ask it, and then I, we can move on, I guess, to Q&A after that. Is that cool? Because I don't want to take too much time. We can see on for days, um, but we're not going to do that. So the next question I wanted to ask, and it's a really important one to me. It's an Oma question, right? It's, it's a real, and the, and the question is this. How do we get the Oma to act as one body, even though we are all from different places and backgrounds? We all have tribalistic traditions. How do we hold on to our cultural identity and way of life, but also acting as an Oma? How do we get there? How do I care about the person in Bangladesh the same way I care about the person in Palestine how do I care about the person in uh, Colombia or Cuba or Chile the same way I care about the person in Palestine? How do I get that fitra and that feeling to bring the ummah together? How do we do that as an ummah? I think that the length of the question kind of shows how little it is. So it's um, very low, but like angle it out yeah. so I can get through each angle. Um, the first thing that you asked, I, I believe, is the whole concept of using Western imperialism, like just like ways other than Islam. Okay, I'm not going to title anything or single any type of thing out. Just the ways of God, the ways of humans. Okay, categorize them into two broad categories: the way of Allah, because we have a clear way of Allah. You can only decide between two things that are actually established and that you can actually choose from. That two systems that actually are consistent. So one system is the system of Allah, it's a consistent, thorough one, that actually has a structure for every step of the way. And there is another way, and that is the ways that we, like again, you study, then you think that they're working in some ways, in some capacities, the ways of people, other than the ways that Allah has shown us. Now, one thing that if you, if you look at it and you compare it is, one is consistent. One actually has like a thorough system and an explanation for every little thing. And one, it's based off of the whim for every, again, it, every five seconds it changes. You know, one thing is ethical today and it's not ethical tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? One thing is moral today and it's completely immoral tomorrow. One thing is legal today, one thing is completely illegal tomorrow. Because there is no system, it's just humans like, yeah, it's totally okay for you know, people uh, uh, you know, to, to go out and carry this action out now, but just a few, maybe decades ago, it would be like, ah, oh, really? Like, this is against every religion. You know what I'm saying? It's not just against the religion of Islam, it's just against you know, everything. And then, like now, it's just like, well, it's, it's okay. You know what I'm saying? Now, like, it's also like, yeah, it's, it's a bad thing if people get together and their family members, they actually have a term for it. But just a few years from now, what if people just come around saying, that, well, they're two consenting adults. That should be okay as well. You know what I'm saying? So if you rely on morals that don't actually have a consistent basis, they don't actually have a principle, then your moral compass is going to have to update just like your iPhone. Okay? Every time something is immoral, then you're going to have to cancel it out in your head as immoral. Every time, every time these people around you tell, tell you something is moral and good, you're going to have to believe that it's good. You know what I'm saying? Every time someone tells you it's woke to say this, you're going to go ahead and say this. Every time someone tells you it's woke to say that, you're going to go ahead and say that. 
whether it had something to do with religion or not, and now how we as Muslims, because you now the second part you've asked is how Muslims have gone away and have, how Muslims have chosen the second route instead of the first route, and, and then why aren't we together and what can we do to be together as a woman? Because that mentality, the other than the way of Allah, teaches that. It teaches wherever you see benefit, you run there. You get what I'm saying? Wherever you see benefit, you run there. Our system teaches us that benefit and harm, you don't gauge it with what you see in front of you, what's happening in front of you. Because you know that there's an entire divine system employed that is far more functional than the system that we see. Allah says, dunya It's all deception that you see around you, it's delusion around you. The entire system of the divine is in full play. A believer actually sees that and makes their moves based off of those calculations, not the calculations of people who only see what's in front of them. Allah says, the people of the dunya, they only see things that are close right in front of them. Allah says, but we see the bigger picture. So now when he sees the bigger picture, he gives you rules and you don't want to use those rules because you feel like what's close and what's working right now, right at this very second, is far more tasty because it's going to make you feel like I'm doing something. And guess what? You missed the whole entire concept of what Allah wants you to do in, in times of injustice. Though uh, there is injustice happening, calculate. Allah says, وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُ Allah says, not a single leaf falls from the sky except that Allah has full control, a full knowledge, full will that, like, okay, it fell. I let it fall. So now you think, well, these 2,000 pound bombs are just going to drop with Allah knowing or knowing. Allah says, well, don't for a second think Allah doesn't know what that means. Allah says, Allah sees all that. The human beings, it's a subconscious thing that we have. Oh, Allah, we try to reach out to you, but you know what? It's not working, so let's go to you know, this person's office. Let's go here, let's go there, let's go there. Allah is like, that's not how I work though. It's not Amazon Prime, where you deliver your order free Palestine and he's going to deliver it to you on your doorstep tomorrow. He didn't even, Rasulullah didn't get to see a free Aqsa unless it was a miracle. In the miraculous night, Allah restored Aqsa for what it once used to be. That's when the problem when it was actually desecrated. It was a dump. That's why they initially did not believe that he went there. And then when he described to them perfectly what it looked like, then they were like, whoa. You know what I'm saying? But they still believe. The Prophet said, my point is, he didn't even see it from us. Okay? So, the, and do you think the Prophet didn't succeed? His tactics didn't work, his, his mercy and all this, uh, the whole thing of don't engage. Like, it didn't work? No, it didn't work. Because they got him like, like a few years after. Just a couple of years, a handful of years after they, they got him, they walked into Aqsa on the red carpet. Could they stay true to his principle? They stay true to that. So historically, we learn, and Umar bin Khattab, again, it's so beautiful, man. Go visit, we'll see if you get a chance, inshallah, when Allah is going read it. Please, when you go there, just before you go, read all these beautiful stories. When I was there, I was picturing in the masjid of Umar bin Khattab. When I, when I was there, and I'm sorry, this one takes a little, little time, but it's so beautiful to me, I have to narrate it. When I went to Palestine, I, I wasn't really feeling anything. Like in my head, yeah, I'm just tired because it was a long flight or whatever. It's late, dark. But when I first got into the, the Aqsa Masjid, it was the first time where my thoughts completely went blank. You know, human beings, like, we can go blank with words, but our thoughts are always just running viral and something completely shocks you. My thoughts caught up. I didn't actually have thoughts or words to put in my thoughts. The first time I could actually put words in my thoughts was actually in a church that Allah bin Allah refused to pray because he felt like if he prayed in there on the opening of Jerusalem just to respect that patriarch's request, and he said, it's time for prayer. Why don't you pray here? It's so show of refreshing. And his far-sightedness, employing the principle of actual private and justice and sound, not of what I feel, PR, public relations, people who have no. Many people will love me. They're going to come after me and turn this into a masjid. And because he said that, I was able to go into that church as a church. I was able to see things that I don't agree with and feel bad for them and make dua for those people because Allah employed the justice of Islam and it still saved me. 
And the tour guide, when he told me, hey, by the way, uh, all of them are praying here, and the guy who uh, we gave the keys to, that's his descendant right there. He opens the door for these church people every single morning, and it's still in his hand. Let's go to his masjid. I was like, whoa, whoa, hold up, buddy. You didn't just speak past that. Like, you didn't just say what you just said. What? All of the Allah gave you? And that's when my mind went back to an all the and when I was in Masjid Umar bin Khattab, just a few feet away, where he actually chose to pray, that was a time where I just felt like a connection to Umar bin Khattab that like I've never ever felt before that beautiful thing. Thank you for not faulting. Thank you for not, like, you know, giving in to your nafs. You know how Umar would do stuff? You know how the principles, we want to follow Umar bin Khattab, we want to love him, we want to claim him, but we don't want to do anything he says or does. What would he do before he did anything? He would ask himself, oh, Umar, what would you want to do? And then he'd be like, all right, cool, we're not doing that. That's how he employed his, his government rules. Whatever he was against his actual nurse. Whatever he thought, like, you know what, this is the right thing to do, but I feel okay, I don't want to do it. And he did it anyways. That's how Allah would have love, you know, walked into Jerusalem like that. And we don't know, if you really think about it, honestly, it looks like all the odds stacked against Muslims. In terms of material, in terms of wealth, in terms of all of that stuff, it's everything that we have, it's just kind of stuck. It's an arm bar of, of desires. You know what I'm saying? All those leaders worshiping their desires, like opening up, like sort of media for concerts instead of more like that. You get what I'm saying? Like, okay, but like, think the Prophet said, literally said at the end of the times, all these things that like intoxicate people from reality, the emergence of singing and dancing so very vividly. You know, people just abusing themselves with drugs, with, with singers, with dancers, all the way until they just completely, they just zone themselves out from reality. How do you think all these Israeli people are capable of taking all those TikToks with songs on as they're depicting, as they're trying their best to mimic human suffering? How do you think they can put their song to the Prophet so says this stuff is bad for your soul? That's what it does to you. They didn't do that to you yet. That's what it'll do to you even if you claim you're Muslim. These people were once the promised people, the people of Musa, this is what they pick up. What does Allah say? We talk about, you know, the, the name I like is Awdah, the return. But what does Allah talk about when He says that concept? If you return to how you were, we'll return to what we used to give But if you return to the ways of people who mess up, then we will also return to subjugating you just the way you subjugated them. Right? So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to move past and say, oh, we need systems that are, you know, semi un Islamic, uh, just in order to get the job done. We don't need that. That stuff is absolute, like, it needs to be rectified. We're for real. We're at protests. I'm giving you a lot of examples. We're at protests. We should ask shy away from saying, Allah, 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 Allah. If somebody wants to say it, alhamdulillah. They don't want to say it. No one's forcing them to say it. They want to chant it, no problem. But that's literally what we out there depicting. There is no God but Allah, Muhammad's messenger. That's why we out here. What was the battle of the Sahaba and the battle of Yaman? Wa Muhammad. Oh Muhammad, for the love of the, that we have for Muhammad's law, he said, we're coming. Right? And we out here, we're like, nah, I don't see that. That's just looking for you. Allah, Akbar. Allah is greater than everything. The Sagbi was chanted by people who were beaten because they chanted it. And that's why Allah gave it to them. They paid a price, they paid their dues. We want to do just the right amount of activism that doesn't mess with our own little comfort zone. That's our problem. And whatever system we find that depicts that system where it's convenient, easy going, and doesn't have too much of the whole God thing included, well, It'll be easier for me to now continue doing activism and have all of my friends with me. Whereas, the goal is not that. The goal is to fight for justice. The goal is, you know what I'm saying, do the right thing. The goal is not to like, make people happy. If certain people like it and they're happy because of it, alhamdulillah. If certain people choose to misunderstand it, they can come to us to ask. Would any Muslim shy away from teaching a non-Muslim who comes to them and asks them simply like, let's see their chanting Allah Akbar, Loki that has terrified me in the past. What does it actually mean? Do you think any Muslim would shy away from teaching them the actual meaning? Now there are those people who will do that when they hear that. Those are the people you want with you. There are those people who say, no, these Muslims are really trying to take over. Those are the people, okay, cool. Uh, we like your support, but thanks and no thanks. We don't want that. 
That's going to contaminate our names. That's going to contaminate our protests. The protest is not us reaching out to those poor. The, poor, the protest is blah. The protest is us and y'all love. You didn't give us the ability to go actually help that child. You just gave me my vocal cord, and here I, I am using it. Ya Allah, you take this vocal cord of mine saying, free Palestine, from the river to the deep Palestine. Ya Allah, you take this chant of mine as a dua and accept it, and you give us free. We don't know how it's going to be free. We don't know who's going to come. We don't know what Allah's going to do. The Abu Muqlid, the grandfather of the Prophet, said when the actual house of Allah, the Ka'aba, was under attack, he didn't know what to do because they had elephants. Elephants were things Arabs have never seen, so they titled the whole year the year of the elephants out because they said, whoa, what are those, right? Because when they saw the elephants, they just lost all hope. Abdul Muttalib did too, but he didn't stop fighting for what he thought was right. And that's what he did. He went to Abraha, the tyrant's court, and he said, your soldiers have been messing up my, my, my everything, and my shepherds are complaining, or sorry, my camel raisers are complaining that they've usurped 200 camels. I need them back. Abu Bakr was like, dude, I thought you were intelligent. I thought you were going to come negotiate about the bigger problem, the bigger picture, the God. Right? Why are you here talking about this little thing, the soldiers, whatever? You can go get. He gave a principled response. Listen to this. Any kind of love my family. Well, I'm going to debate you love them. Say it to me. Say it to me. He said, me? As far as me, I'm responsible. I'm entrusted as the person in charge of these camels. Because the camels belong to the one who's under my authority. So this is my responsibility. The responsibility of the Kaaba, the Kaaba has a Lord. The Kaaba has a responsible one. He'll take care of it. And that's what Allah sent those tiny little birds who destroyed that whole army. Because even a person who didn't have the, the Iman, Rasulullah was not born yet, Allah what he was saying. But he had one principle locked down. That is, when I don't understand things, I don't try to make them up. I leave it to Allah. I leave it to Allah. And that's why whenever the Prophet he would go out and battle himself, even though his grandfather didn't even get to see his son. His, his battle cry, the Prophet's battle cry was, I'm the Prophet, there's no lie about that because I'm the child of Abdul Muttalib. He's the son of Abdul Muttalib. But Abdul Muttalib said, This, to defend one house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we better learn to use these same principles to defend this household. In this comes up of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not, it's not all the things property, it's not our property, it's not, it's about, it all belongs to Allah. We, we, we defending and we doing all this stuff for Him. And if we ever lose sight of that, we just need to reorient ourselves. And inshallah, and educate as many people as you possibly can. Not most of them have to do that. If they would like to join the cause out of humanity, that is excellent. You know, the Prophet sort of actually joins causes. That had nothing to do with Islam prior to Islam that were just based off of justice. Study the history of Kenneth and Farood. I'll tell you in a nutshell what happened was there was one Yemeni guy who was in Mecca doing business with a with a Mecca Qurashi. Qurashi is the most elite tribe with a Qurashi businessman. And the Qurashi businessman said, Yeah, I'll pay you back later. But whenever this Yemeni guy would come to collect Al Sin Wife, that was a guy's name, Al Sin Wife, Al Sin Wife, he would come back tomorrow. And then you come back tomorrow, he's like, I come back tomorrow, come back tomorrow. And then finally, this Yemeni guy got over. His name was uh, Zubayr. He gave his powerful speech. He went to the house of Abdullah bin Jadan, where they kind of gathered to sort out their affairs. Like, uh, and this is an actual complaint. And he said, Ya Allah, Amaka, Ana Mablu. Ya Ahla Fahd, Ana Mablu. Who is Fahd? Does anyone know? It's a trick question. No. Fahd is Quraysh. Fahd is Quraysh's real name. Right? The Quraysh, the Gospels, and the Sunday. That's Quraysh. Israel, the Quraysh is like, well, I should be a That's his title. But, uh, Fahd is that. This whole family of Fahd. They invoking their grandfather. That your grandfather, Quraysh, this stands for the same stands for justice. Ya Allah, Fahd. I'm Maklou. I'm being oppressed in the valleys of Bakhshad and Makkah, in the valleys of Makkah. So now when he said that, all of those community people got together, the leaders, and they said that, you know, what well, else you gotta pay back your loans, and you know, they, and they all formed a treaty, and they couldn't actually like read or write, they were all unlettered people. So how they would sign back in the day was they would dip their hands in perfume and put it on the on, on, on thing, on the Kaaba, and that's why it was also called Hedlum Muhayyibin, because Layyib means perfume. 
right? There was the, the oath of all the pledge of allegiance or the treaty, the truce of all those people who get their hands in perfume. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he actually participated. And he didn't participate, he heard of this. And when he heard of this, he says if Hamful Falun was, again, it was all about giving the rights to people who owe people of the one. He said if Hamful Falun was still around, I'd still support him. Right? So again, if they want to join the cause, they have to do that. But the thing is, not on terms that don't belong to, 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 to anybody else but Allah to dictate. And we really believe that it's, it's a dictatorship from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the most merciful extent. Right? It's almost oxymoronic what I said. What I say, but that's exactly what it is. It's the most merciful, yet we are all his abd. Abd is that slave. We gotta start acting like slaves. You know what I'm saying? We gotta stop acting like we're the masters and we're gonna get it done. No. Allah is the one who get it done. Allah is the one who get it done. We start acting right. We're gonna be closing it out. Uh, first of all, is I don't have any questions, I don't want to raise their hands um, before we summarize and close everything out. Great, okay. Can someone help with the mic? Or you can give them that one. Oh, there's one. That, okay, there's cool. one, the handheld one. The red wire? Yeah. The orange wire has the microphone connected to it. That's, I think, uh, Oh, maybe it might be inside that thing. If it isn't, it's okay. We could, I think we hear. You had another mic the whole time? Yeah, but it was kind of confiscated. Oh, All right. Yeah. Here, I'm going to make it easy. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, man. I need some water. Hmm? Once you're back. But, sorry. That's good though. That's you can um, do it also. Hello. Um, well, I have just a question, and also that is another thing that I'm involved with at the shop, which is this that you know, I don't think that we are trying to be less uh, Muslim, but also coming from like to start from their level. I am from Colombia, um, I speak Spanish, English, Alhamdulillah, I learned my prayers in Arabic and my Quran. But where it's like, I have no idea what it is. Mm -hmm. And you know, and the little thing, even though I'm very much interested and continue to learn, it's hard for me to understand, even though I'm very interested. Now, coming from the level of the other people that say US people, you know, North American born, whatever it is, Peruvian, from whatever else. Uh, stop, like, not to say a lot of our not because Allah is not great, but because we have the knowledge to know that God is great also in English, in Spanish. It means the same thing. I don't think I, if I, um, I will be less Muslim if I decide not to chant a lot of God because I don't want to, I want to protect ourselves, I want to protect the people also that are trying to fight against the cause of humanity. Know, a genocide. Um, I'm pretty sure there is a lot of people which I know who Palestinian people that they go to McDonald's, they try to keep up with the Kardashians, with Christmas and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, they are there for the, you know, and at the same time, um, it says in the Quran, like for their, for them, it's not religion, the Christians and the Jews and for all those other religions. Mm -hmm. Now, the United, you know, forces in order to protect, okay, it is, it is written that who is morally Okay, but if at the moment uh, it is what is actually created like a small hole for other people to see what's going on. I don't see, I mean, I guess we are doing these things starting from there, but not like up. trying to be against Islam. And so, said that, what, what do you suggest as an unconventional um, strategy to do it? Like, okay, Okay, 
I mean, besides currently, obviously, like multiplying yourself and whatnot, and to meet more people in Islam, what is that unconventional that we should do without harming us? Because you know, I feel like making people believe that we are terrorists, but we're actually trying to, you know, to maintain our being or, um, or you know, our religion, but at the same time, we are in the United States. We are not mm -hmm. a Muslim country. And, and try to, you know, show them that, like, we're already here, we're already doing the movie jazz and, you know, all the best events. But, but they're not really understanding it because, as you say, the media, it's, it's the whole narrative is the media, what they say. So what is, that, what is the unconventional and effective way that, you know, that we can unite as Muslims without uh, stopping being Muslims? But also going to the level of the people by teaching them in, in their level. Mm -hmm. <coughs> <coughs> Zakhla, I guess for the question, it's a very good question uh, about um, you know how can we employ new unconventional or Islamic principles. Uh, while also not like you know uh, scaring people away or like you know um, protecting the Muslims, you know. And so you have to ask yourself like again. I, I believe I answered this question earlier by giving you the story of, of that box you got. You know what I'm saying? And that's exactly what you're saying. You know, teach people according to their education. Like, were you here for that example that I gave? Right. So what did I say there? I didn't start off by teaching him a law of the I started off by teaching him something that he understood, literally using the language he speaks, right? And the principle that I said that may be unconventional to me at that, in that moment, because the, the other people, the way of the world is, when someone says something to you that breaks your heart, you, you passionately lash out, right? So the principle, the unconventional principle that I employed there was I paused, and I said, what would my Messenger of Allah do in this moment? Would he criticize this per person for saying that he supports you know, that other side? Or would he try to explain it to him in a way that he might actually understand it? And what did I say? The problem is that such a standard principle is he's trying to save as many people from the hellfire as he can. So he would actually explain it to him, just like he explained to that guy who you're named in the corner, not in a way that how dare you come to a house of worship and hear me inside of it and burn people while they're praying. He didn't say that. He said, brother, you know, this is a masjid, you know, it's not made for that, it's made for prayer. You know, if we want to do that, there's other places for that. And then the guy was so moved by that conversation. He said, I didn't see a teacher before him or after him. Then, more beautiful than that, when it comes to one on one interactions, the mercy of the Prophet is the only mechanism that is our principle. Right? But when it comes to Muslims, Muslims organizing anything that we organize, if we are Muslim, our first principle always is what are the principles of Islam taught to us by Rasulullah with our blinders on, actually. You know what I'm saying? Studying those principles thoroughly with our blinders on to what's actually happening around you. Once you thoroughly internalize those principles, now then you can open your eyes to all the realities around you and see how then you can employ those Islamic principles everywhere instead of turning your blinders on to the Islamic principle and looking at activism around you and then see, opening your eyes to Islam and seeing what can I take from Islam to employ my activism. You get what I'm saying? So that's the unconventional method that I'm talking about that manifests itself and I gave the example of the community. That's not the only one thing. I just gave an example because again, like you said, we can be talking here for weeks. That was an example of one thing that I feel like can be changed. That if you look into the Muslim countries, that's all they do. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, being indicative, and stuff like that. But the thing is, the Prophet was they didn't only allow for or encourage that in Muslim countries. If you study his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you will learn that in the very early stages of Islam, when nobody, again, he did keep his mission a little bit secretive until he had just enough people or just enough influential people that, again, right now, you know what, it's, it's okay for you to now go ahead and go openly proclaim this message. The moment they got the green lights, even one of them, Abu Bakr of Allah, who didn't have the green light to go ahead and openly proclaim the message, he still did. He was beat for it. They were tortured for it. Civil ones from Muslim, 
were, again, arrested for. I, you get what I'm saying? So they went, what I'm saying that the Islamic principle is you do the right thing regardless of what's going to happen to you. That's how you protect. You ask, you ask well, how do we protect ourselves? You rely on the protection that doesn't come from yielding to God's laws. You, you rely on the protection that comes from the divine when you actually follow his laws. You get what I'm saying? And following his law is when you're praying. God has to be at the center of it all and say Allah, but it's something so very standard. Now, if somebody is removed from amongst the people of the world, the quality of what God's, the greatest, has to offer in his statement, it's our job as Muslims to restore it. It's our job for Muslims and Muslims to reintroduce it to people, to teach the people. How are you ever going to teach a new group of people something that's so very essential and basic to Islam? Because if, it, I mean, if you fear the, 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 the chance that they may not understand, even if you explain to them nicely. You know what I'm saying? Even if we, did, we explain to them nicely, they don't understand. You know what? That's why we're not going to just explain or we're going to take it slowly or eventually we'll get to a point where we can explain to them. This arbitrarily haphazard goal of employing Islam eventually in the future. No, no, no. You've got to start with Islam and see how we can now take this Islam and put in all the activities of the world. Not, hey, these are my activities and I've got to draw from Islam to see which one of my activities matches with and only take from Islam that. Allah says very clearly in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amin, oh you who claim to believe in me. If you don't claim to believe in me, no problem. Do what you want. But if you claim to believe in me, who 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 fits in Kikaf? When you're Muslim, you are Muslim all the way. You don't do half this Islam just to kind of say, well, now these people need to learn the other half when they learn how to teach them. No, you're Muslim all the way. Now, if somebody else does not want to chant with you, they don't have to. You know, that's what I'm saying. This whole protest is one thing. It's a prayer to Allah. And that's what it has to be at the center of every Muslim person who's marching in here. Not every non-Muslim person. That's why I also said you don't force any person to know, hey, why aren't you chanting Allah? It doesn't mean anything bad. Why don't you know? If someone doesn't feel uncomfortable, just let them be. Let them just walk with us. You know what I'm saying? Just let them walk with us. If they don't feel like saying that, Allah, 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 there's no forcing the religion. But at the same time, the people of the religion have to be at the center Chanting what they're actually out there chanting a prayer to Allah. Now, if it's not a prayer to Allah because we're too shy or we fear the consequences of it, then the protection that we are seeking is not protection worthy of being sought. You get what I'm saying? The protection that we seek must be actually divine protection because that's the only protection that matters. For us as dunya, as a, as a believer, our principles on life are very, very different to people who don't actually understand. When you asked me the question of fitrah, I didn't actually use the term fitrah. I think uh, Brother Ahmed kind of said it because he, he was maybe like when you say something that you know the whole time, you don't translate it right away. Fitrah means nature. You know what I'm saying? You, uh, Allah, and Allah's laws, they're very in tune with the nature, the disposition of how human beings already work. Which is why when you say nature or you say Islam, they sometimes say intertwined because we say our laws that Allah has which gives to us because He's our maker, He gets to say that these are natural to you and your composition. Right? So now based off of that, this fitrah, this religion, and its principles are so very perceived, so very authentic, so very available for us to learn them and act according to them, that we don't need to now go to another system for see and observe another system and say that this is, is the safest for us. Because our idea of safety and protection is very different than somebody else's idea of safety and protection. So in principle, the reason why I say what I say is because in principle it, it doesn't matter. Can I add something to that? For yeah. personal? Um, that's a great question, by the way. Uh, that's a really good question because as a, as a Muslim who is somewhat active, uh, with different people of different backgrounds. Um, and one of them was actually in here today. <laughs> I can put it on blast. But uh, um, no, seriously, we've had, I've had this conversation with people, and even at work, in the workplace, about things of that nature. I think to keep it simple, what you believe and who you are as a Muslim is your right. You understand? You don't have to fear that. It doesn't mean if you believe something, right, or your religion tell like 
basically says this is the way things should be done, or you should stay away from this, that you don't like the other people, or that you hate the other people, or that if they feel like that, like we're a coalition, we deal with Jewish people, secular people, atheist people, we deal with everybody. That's what I'm being, right? So you can't force my religion on me, but you can't force your ways on me either. You understand? Now, if you have a cause, right? You have any cause, it's a uh, fight for cancer, right? Or whatever it is. And as much as if you want to go, you want to stand up for that cause. And somebody brings another cause that you personally know goes against your need. It's okay for you to not walk with that person or to even explain to that person, I can't stand with you because of what you've been for. That's okay. We shouldn't fear that. You understand? There are so many people that are understanding and open to this, right? The same way they want us to be open to letting them live their lives or is the same opportunity that we should have as Muslim people. Muslimin is not just wearing a, a headscarf, a jibbad, and going to prayer. It's a way of life. So, you would want people, not everybody's going to understand that. But I think the main point is don't sell out because you want to please people. Period. Point in life. Right? And you can do it without being rude or mean. And you can do it with still standing up for justice, whatever it is you want to stand up for. Just make sure it doesn't go against your core and who you are, because you will not find but in it. Okay? And that's the way I do it. Live the way I live 100%, but let me live too. You know? So, yeah. Is that okay, Chef? Yeah, no, wonderful, yeah. Michelle. Any other questions? I don't know somebody else has had a question, right? Yes. Awesome. That's an excellent question. It pierces the bloodness, but it's excellent. So, um, I know what, what our, our belief is anybody who, who uh, says when they flick, again, I don't know who's this guy, I don't know, again, like the whole organization, that's what I started with. I don't know the organization, so I don't condemn random things I don't know, or, or praise things that I don't know. I, Right? And my, 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 my standard is, Ya Allah, whoever is doing anything for your sake, please accept it from them and give them victory. Whoever it is that's on your earth serving you and fighting righteously for your cause in a way that you're pleased with, Ya Allah, you help them, you aid them, you give them victory. Now, who these people are is very difficult for me sitting on this side of the world to be able to comment on that, regardless of what I see, regardless of what I don't see. Right? Um, so now, uh, when, when you hear things like that, are they purely Quran and Sunnah? Uh, or like, 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 is there a hadith about them? The principle is Quran and Sunnah. The principle is based off of hadith. Allah said, Hatta in the same as a Muslim will let them know, but with you, Jah Muslim. He says, There comes a point where all hope is lost. All hope, even starting from the top, the prophets. Are even beginning to say things that people have now rejected us. Go read the translation of Nuh Surah, Surah Nuh. The whole Surah is just that man venting to Allah, oh, I'm trying to open me, I'm trying to shake me, I'm trying to speak to this way. 950 years of activism is doing good of anything. Right? To, to him, that's what he said. But to Allah, that was a success. Nuh is a successful prophet, right? Even though at the end of the day, he didn't have any people following him there, even his own son ran over to his waves. He didn't get to convert his own son. 
الله سبحانه وتعالى سيدنا نوح ولا العزي من الرسل ولا وندق مسجد الله يا الله الله سبحانه وتعالى كان 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 It seems like when all hope is lost, yet there's still going to be that one person. The Musa Islam, all he had in front of him was the Red Sea, and all he had behind him was Sarawun. And all he had around him were people, annoying people, but he saw him saying, Inna la mudrakum, Musa, see? We're caught. Musa showed him, showed them so many miracles before, yet still when they see an impossible situation, what do they say? Oh, we only see that which is around us. So, In that other room, we caught. And everybody's hope is lost. So there's that one man, the Prophet Musa, when he says, Can never in the say me. Maybe he's not with y'all, but my, my Lord is with me, you show me the way. That's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in Musa, he let us stand, he's been playing with this whole time, and showing a miracle here, showing a miracle there. Now it's time for it to actually be put to work. Take that step and get that ocean and watch what we do. Watch what we do. It's the main thing. Take your, take your stick and hit the ocean. Allah says, I do things that don't make sense to y'all. I've done it all throughout history. Why don't y'all get the message? Why don't y'all get the memo? I do unconventional things. I don't do things that make sense to people. I use birds or elephants. I use a mosquito for that tyrant who tried to burn him by doing his son alive. I use so many different things to show you that I don't need a lot. For Musa, this is this whole Red Sea. Well, that's it all. You take, take your whole staff and get it. Watch what I do. Then it's Then each side of that ocean became like a mountain. And then, and Jaina Musa, we saved Musa. All of the people. And it seemed like, how is this Najat? How is this safe? They just ran away from home. They were expelled from their home. They made it to the other side of the desert. Like, like literally, there's desert on this side. How is that Anjay and Musa? We saved Musa and all the people. Allah was saying, Y'all just define victory with what you see victory being paraded as amongst ranks that are not yours. Well, when I clearly define for you victory throughout my book, Study these and understand that every person, now coming back to your question, every person who's committed this level of bullying, genocide, being killed, burning people, doing all of these te terrible things, read the first few verses of Surah Fajr. That's how I'll answer because that's the Quran verse that came to my head when you asked me the question. Allah says, Do you not see? Do you not see what I did to a nation called Aad? Aad used to live in that whole area too. If you go to Jordan, you'll see all the, the remnants of those people. Aad. Allah says those people, all those mountains that you see, they carved them with their bare hands. Y'all think they're strong? They took their hands and they made, they went like this and they made homes out of mountains. They used to take a tree, look at it out like this one, and rip it out with their own hands. Allah says these people it got to their heads so bad that they started saying things like, Men Who is stronger than us? You hear this like little hillbilly guy, oh, I'm going to post so many explosives that I'm going to fear God and I'm like, now who would do that? He meant that. People spoke like this before too. Fir'aun said, Allah says, do you not see what I did to Allah? They used to say, who is stronger than us and might? Allah says, I will know one of them all. Then I see Allah is the one who made them so strong, he's stronger than them a little bit. But every time we send them verse after verse, proof after proof that y'all are wrong, they would just continuously, stubbornly, arrogantly turn blind. Then Allah says, These are people erected such buildings that nobody ever seen anything like them. And then it says, Allah says, The same type of people, strong, mighty, invincible, and other in this I just told you all the whole story of Fir'aun and how this man really established himself with his apartheid system as the supreme man on earth that no one else and he's like they're just some savage barbarians that are trying to drive him out. Allah says, well, Fir'aun did not die. You saw these people? That they have transgressed all bounds and all lands? Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, 
فصب عليهم ربك سوف عذاب. الله ليه أنليش ذي وقت وفنش منهم. سوف الوقت وقت. الله ليه وقت وتفنش. إن ربك لا بد من صعب. Don't worry, Allah is watching you. Right? Allah says, فأما الإنسان the only problem is, as far as the human is concerned, إذا ما فلاه ربه ونعم يتسج فأكرمه and test you with goodness, with good circumstances. Like we give you all the respect, the honor, ونعمه we give you نعم. فيقول ربي أكرمنا say, oh Allah, you've been nice to me. وأما إذا ما فلاه ونعم يتسج فقدر عليه and take some of your things away. فيقول ربي أحانا then you turn your back to me. Allah says, this is your problem. In the Cyrus, I took care of him. I'll take care of you too. But you need to come back to behaving the way I want you to behave. So inshallah, it is going to, your end is going to come. No, this is why I'm here and I'm going to get away with it for too long. Especially when I, like, I had full conviction of it when I saw that little hillbilly soldier doing what he was doing and giving that speech. And he said those arrogant things that he said. I was like, it's over for these people. Let them enjoy it. Let's put them down, honey. Some of the well and gentlemen will be so mad. Just a little stuff that they're enjoying, and they're going to hell. Well, because of me, that is a bad, 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 bad place to go. So again, whatever is going to happen to them, whether it's in the dunya or in the akhira, their end is in deep covenant. Allah Azawajal does not allow a bulim to, to reign forever. If it ever does get to a point where it's reigning supremely to a point where it feels like it's never, ever going to end, and it's actually the case, then that's the end of the world. Then the Nusayi Salaam comes and that's it, it's over. When he comes, well, no. You know what I'm saying? So at that point, you don't have to do a lot of guesswork. If it's actually you will be everyone will know. If it's actually the day of judgment, everyone will actually know. So you don't have to worry about is this the day of judgment, what you gotta do, no, no, no. no you gotta do what you gotta do, and that's what's right. And that is to fight for liberation, for good justice, for goodness. The Prophet even says, even if you hear the trumpet of the day of judgment being blown and you're planting something, plant it. Because that trumpet is not in your control, the planting is. So continue doing what you gotta do. Do the right thing, inshallah, the help of Allah which it is indeed near, and any person who rightfully and righteously believes that, whoever they may be, is speaking the truth. So you want to end it off? Maybe, yeah, yeah. inshallah. Mm-hmm. See, and you, if people want to ask me after mm-hmm. privately as well, I guess. Yeah, just... Is my head bigger than yours? Uh... Well, 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 well. Um, so, I know we asked for a few questions. Does anyone else have any questions? Alright, everybody. Um, we didn't even get to go through all the questions that we had today. Uh, I will say this. Inshallah, we're going to do more of these. Inshallah. Uh, and we want people to engage, because I think engagement is really good. Um, question, like, I personally have, the last 20, 25 years since 9-11, I've had, I've seen it, I've seen a lot. You know, I was a sophomore in high school, 9-11. I remember what Muslims went through in this country. I remember having to please people to make them feel like I wasn't a terrorist because my name is Ahmed Yassim, and I'm Palestinian. I remember those days. But I also remember that confidence that my mother and my father instilled in me. I remember them being Muslim and unashamed of being Muslim. I remember my mother sticking up her little finger to racist white people that would talk smack to her while she's driving in the car and not care. I know that's not the right stemming thing to do, so I don't think it's a problem. But she kept it real. And I think at the core is we need to know our we shouldn't be first of all, you shouldn't be scared. And if you are scared, it's okay. That only means you to learn a little more about who you are, about your being, about the justice within you. You know, our deen is not made for injustice, it's made for justice. So if you're fearful or you're afraid of what people think of you, that's completely understandable. We had trillions of dollars worth of propaganda, trillions of dollars worth of war against the Islamic civilization in the last 20 years. Right? We gotta remember, like, this is, this is and they've been doing it, it's not working. Uh, if you do permit, I wanna say one thing to yeah. that, to, to that very point right there. Though, what, what, what does it say? Like, what are the memes that we're, we're seeing on Instagram? 
of Ammu Khalid, the guy who, Ruh al Ruh, you know what I'm saying? He's now helping every person in the hospital or whatever. Their whole life, since that occasion that you're speaking of, they've been trying to demonize people who look like that. Yeah. Allah Azza wa Jal, when He wants to expose the truth, all it takes is one Ammu Khalid. That's it. That's a live example of how it's working. Ammu so, Khalid is the, the, the guy in the Gaza Haram who looked like what they portrayed as a Taliban terrorist holding his beautiful granddaughter while she was she's dead, right? And subhanAllah, I've I personally seen miracles in the last 20 years. And I'm seeing miracles right now with all this craziness that we're living through. What I've seen personally, I've seen 9 11 happen. I've seen every mainstream media in the world propagandize people to hate the Islam. Like, and the complete opposite is happening. Why? If that's not a miracle, I, I don't know what it is. You know? I don't know. I'm telling you, I lived through it, I've seen it, right? But not that I'm not. Old, but I've seen a lot in 20 years. So we've been at war for the last 20 years. Since this is a talk show, I'm gonna answer your question, yeah. bro. You don't know what is. Allah says, When the truth comes out, batil disappears. It goes back like a bed bug hiding in its hole. It was never strong. It never had a leg to stand on to begin with. Right? It was always flimsy, Allah says. Go on. And like you just said, it's really just something called Hasbara. You know what Hasbara is? It's propaganda. It was like a propaganda playbook. Like you would see like an NFL playbook with the coach, right? They have propaganda playbooks that they use to make you afraid to be you, right? They use the right, they use, they use the right wing, they use the left wing, they use the center. It's all propaganda. And when you, the, the day that you're not fearful of that propaganda and know how to combat it, that's because you educated yourself. First on who you are, what your belief system is, uncompromising, un un right? And then you also educate yourself about the society around you, right? About geopolitics, about you know the mainstream media, about what their intentions are. I know it's not easy, it's so much information, but at least if you start with you, what your principles are, and who you are, then all that stuff is just background noise. You're not afraid. You know? And then if you learn extra stuff, that's great, hey, you know? But at least start with you, your nature, your fitna, right? As Muslim. If you have no for you, you were, yourself, man. Okay, so whatever brought you to this deen, remember that, learn more, and don't be ashamed, like, don't be ashamed, ever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sister, I, I think I get what you're saying and what he, he's trying to answer. I, I kind of see where both of you are coming from, so let me just kind of help him and help you both kind of see that it's not very different what you're saying. Look, in, in terms of not forcing down this religion on, on someone to, in order for them to like it or believe it, that principle is and like it's, it's accurately employed when you don't ask them to do that. When you don't ask them to say, hey, everybody now, you know, say, repeat after me, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasul. No, it's just a chant. We're doing it. Y'all just tag along. You want to say it, say it. If you don't want to say it, no problem. 
you get what I'm saying? And if you if you want to make a judgment about La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah before actually learning what it is, then we don't want people who don't want to even learn what someone else's culture is, what someone else's religion is. What La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah Allah Akbar means everything to us as a convert. That's what Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen can make people and turn to the fold of Islam. So that's the core of our faith. Now we want to share this the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't keep this faith as like something that, that you gatekeep to yourself. Share it with people. Don't force it on people, but share it with people. If you have something so very beautiful and it's a system that might save you from the hellfire, why would you not want to and share it with the people? Whether they like it or not, that's not your job. But your job is the moment you grab the idol of Muhammad Rasulullah as as a kalima, as a beautiful way of life. As Muslims, we don't keep good things to ourselves, we share them. Now, if somebody doesn't want to take it from us, we don't force them. But we definitely share. And la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, la ilaha Allah Akbar. We're not, we're not going out there and cursing people and saying death to the Arabs and may your Prophet Muhammad be. That's what they chant. We don't do that. We don't do that. We don't say anything negative. We don't curse anybody. When I see people chanting out curses, low key I look at them, it makes me laugh a little bit because I, it's hilarious some, sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Even when I see uh, uh, Ahmed go say, go oh, out now, little bit, it makes, me, it makes me smile, makes me chuckle. But then I'm reminded immediately of something beautiful Islam taught when this happened. You know what the Prophet said one time, he was sitting with his wife, Aisha, and a group of Jews came to visit. And these people were conniving. But back then, too, like even the bad ones from amongst them, not all of them were bad, but the bad ones from amongst them were conniving back then, too. They actually became convert to join his ranks and try to like, assassinate him. So they were really, really bad people. So these people, they came and they, under the pretext that we have to ask them a question, right? And in the official meeting, how did they greet him? They said, Assalamu alaikum. Kind of like how we say Assalamu alaikum because we want to say it faster. You know, you know what I'm saying? Actually, in Arabic, in post Arabic, means death be upon you instead of peace be upon you. So when his wife heard, <laughs> she was so fiery, so she went, Assalamu she went off, right? She, every curse word she knew, she unleashed upon the, uh, uh, these Jewish people. So now the Prophet said, Allah, why you said, instead of saying, you know what I'm saying? He didn't say none of that stuff. He even he get mad at them. He looked to them and said, Oh, why did I come to you? And he, that's it. The, the, that's what you're supposed to say when a non Muslim says salam to you. That's the principle. They say salam, why did I come to you? Peace be upon you. You say, Why did I come to you? You get what I'm saying? That's what you're supposed to say in general. So he didn't deviate from the principle. They said, Salam, why did I come to you? Why did I come to you? Right? So now Aisha says, Ya Rasulullah, like in her defense, in her own head, she's like, Ya Rasulullah. Did you not hear what they just said? Because he actually got mad at her. What did he say to her? Yeah, Aisha, Yaki, Aisha, Aisha, stay away from obscenity. Stay away from vulgarity. We don't use these words. We don't say foul things. Right? And subhanAllah, when she said, Ya Rasulullah, when the Smaq al Ya Rasulullah, they started, you didn't hear what they said. Basically, your response was weak. Like, you had to up it. You know what I'm saying? Someone curses at you, you come back with five, six curse words. You know what I'm saying? You, you come up with variations of their, the curse word that they never heard in their life. That's what you do to win a curse battle. That's in your head. She said, Ya Rasulullah, did you not hear what they said? The Prophet simply responded with a simple thing. I responded. Did you not hear? I responded already. That's how we respond. That's it. Period. Why? Period. That's it, you don't take it beyond. So our religion is so beautiful and has so many of these beautiful examples. Why would you not want to share it with people? You know what I'm saying? Like, why would you not why would you want to keep this to yourself? If people want to like, not in a bad way, like no one is shape I sister, what you're saying is absolutely with care for the woman. I see the care that you have in your heart for the, somebody not being harmed. Right from the Ummah of Rasulullah because of you know somebody out there being reckless, and I do agree with the fact that there's so many from amongst us who are reckless, but that's also because they don't study the Sunnah, they don't study what the Prophet did when people started wilding out. Even his own wife, he, he didn't let it slide, he got mad at her in front of them for violating principles. So, this is our beautiful deen. All we're saying is stay with this beautiful deen, regardless of what people feel about it, and people feel a certain way. They come to you and ask you, explain to them. 
If they come to you, and I'm sorry, and they criticize you, and they make an assumption about you, try to still explain to them. But if they run away from the cause because they feel like this cause is too Muslim for them, then they got the message very correctly. It is a very Muslim cause. <laughs> and we would not like that part of us. You get what I'm saying? Because again, for us, it's humanitarian second. It's for Allah first. Allah will make it humanitarian when we make it about Allah. When we make it about humans, Allah will be like, all right, you, you can figure it out yourself. That's, that's the message that I'm trying to get. Protection to us is not the protection of saying sign. Protection for us is not the protection of, you know, potentially somebody being harmed for saying the right thing. When you didn't say anything wrong, you should not fear even if someone harms you because you know many people have been harmed for saying the right thing before you. And if we want to be anything like them, we have to be willing to put our money where our mouth is for real. You get what I'm saying? There's so many people who claim, Allah says, do people really think we're going to leave them alone saying that we believe in God and we're not going to put them through a test? Allah says, min qabli. We tested every person before you who claimed that they believe in God. We actually put them to test to see whether they really believe in God. Allah said, that's my standard system of sifting out those who are true to their claim that we're actually fully believers and reliers upon Allah and those who just said that for the sake of sin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those people who really, again, like share this beautiful message, share this beautiful people by way of our example. You know what I'm saying? And by way of our example, we don't need to be reckless, we don't need to chant anything negative, nothing foul. But we do need to Islamify our chants. And if our chants are not Islam, Islamified, then the intention behind those chants will not be entering any person's heart. Everything, the Prophet of what did he say? The core of this faith is in the faith is in the al-a'mal bin niyat. Your actions are governed by your intentions. You can't have an intention of praying to God when you're you're yelling somebody else or you're yelling, you know, even one of God's lands. We're not like no, it's not Philistine that's special. It's Allah that's special that said it's special because he said so. Right? So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to read that like, quick in verse. I mean. With that being said, inshallah, let's, 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 let's wrap it up over here. Yeah. Let's make a small dua, inshallah. Yes. I just wanted to make a, a point. That yeah. I, um, I know you said we need to Islamify our chants, but I think we should actually take it a step further. And we need to Islamify our organization. It's, it's, it's very sad for myself and for the rest of the community in South Florida that we don't have a single organization that is faith-based, that is Muslim, that is fighting against injustice. And we definitely, as a community, need to work on making those organizations there. So we don't have to shy away from being outwardly Muslim, right? The organization is Muslim, you want to work with us, you know what you're getting yourself into. So it's my step. Inshallah, and this is absolutely a beautiful first step. There's so much hope in, in direction that the Musa is done, what he had to really train those people to be deserving of that sea split. He trained them real good, and even from most of the, the people he trained, there were some people who said, nah, Musa, it ain't going to work out. You know what I'm saying? So, like, again, like, they're, 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 when tragedy happens, before I make the dua, I'll just say this. When tragedy happens, Allah is testing some, Allah is rewarding some, and Allah is baking some. And Allah is punishing some. Don't be a nice guy. And punishing some is people who see wrong and don't do the right thing about it. You get what I'm saying? Doing, doing the right thing also, and not doing the right thing also includes doing the right thing in the wrong way. You get what I'm saying? If you do the right thing in the wrong way, it doesn't count as the right thing. You get what I'm saying? So, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala us from those who are being baked. Because that's what happens. Allah towards you bakes a community and then the Dawood comes out of the moment. Allah, 
اللهم اغفر لنا ولاخواننا المصارعين في فلسطين وفي سائر بلاد الشام وفي سائر بلاد العالم يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم كن معهم ولا تكن عليهم اللهم انصرهم على عدوك وعدوهم يا ارحم الراحمين اللهم احفظ المسجد الاقصى اللهم اصنع منهم كافرين الله يغفر لكم يا سيدنا يا رب العالمين دروس من نومي دروس من أمي يا الله يا رسول الله ما نعوز 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 ما